regularly scheduled uh, meeting for the audit committee, of the California State Bar. Um, why don't we begin by uh, uh, taking a roll? Here. Chen. Dylan. Here. So um, I believe uh, we should start with uh, any public comment. If there's anybody on the phone or in the audience that would like to make a public comment, now is the time to do that. Hearing none, um, we're going to move to uh, business. I believe today uh, we only have one item, um, and that is uh, that's the work plan. That is correct. Uh, John, why don't you introduce yourself and, and walk us through uh, right. the 2020 work plan? Sounds good. So my name is John Adams. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the State Bar of California. Today, the only item on the agenda is the discussion and adoption of the 2020 audit um, work plan. And so as part of the strategic planning session that occurred yesterday, um, annual work plans are adopted by each committee, and then those uh, plans go to the executive committee uh, for concurrence and adoption. So this uh, work plan is very similar to last year. A lot of the items that are on it are reoccurring for the audit committee, um, as the audit committee has a defined role in our aud audit charter. Um, for 2019, and just go down through each one of these, and we can discuss them as needed. The first one is just the quarterly um, review of travel expenses by executives and board members. That is just a simple audit function that the audit committee reviews on a quarterly basis. The next item, um, which started really last year, um, is a comprehensive review of um, items that the state bar has to show compliance on. Um, so that compliance review started last year and continues. We identified, um, you know, as we go through and talk about um, the items that we need to be in compliance with, um, and then identify ones if there are any that we're not 100% in compliance work towards that. And so we do have an update schedule for you um, by Linda in, in May, or at least mid-year um, through here. State Auditor. Um, this is something that is done every two years by the State Auditor. Um, where there's a report and a review of um, various functions and activities by the state bar. The last one started in October of 2018 um, after the approval of the fee bill. That report was finalized in April of 2019 and we would expect that the state auditor potentially would be back on um, the end of this calendar year. So part of the audit committee would be to be, um, uh, you know, just monitor the progress and then be introduced to any areas of um, audit by the, um, by the auditor. The next one, which is really the substantial part of what the audit committee does, is just the annual um, financial audit. Um, as you recall, we had a meeting with um, our partner um, from MGO, David Bullock, January 15th. Um, the start of the audit has begun. Um, the, they will be on site in February or in March, and an audit report will be provided back to the committee in April. Um, and so that's part of uh, the annual plan is just the um, annual financial statement. And then something that is new and was a discussion as we discussed the work plan on January 15th that was added um, since we last met was involvement by the um, audit committee um, for our business continuity plan. Um, the state bar has started that process um, identifying um, key items um, to continue in case there's any business interruption. Um, in the past, the committee has been involved in reviewing risk um, for the agency and doing a risk assessment, and I believe that was done in 2018. So it's sort of a continuation of that, um, and we will brief um, the committee on that in the fall. And then the final item, um, every two years we do IT um, systems assessments. Um, we have one scheduled this summer to start, um, and this one is related to our, ap our application security. And so that would start this summer. Um, we would provide um, additional updates during the year, and it would go to the board in the winter. So with that, that covers uh, the overall plan. Um, Steve Mazur is here with me to discuss any of the items, specifically the last two business continuity and the IT system assessment. So with that. Um, no, I don't have any. We had a very good meeting, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, uh, John and Steve, I just have uh, one question. Thank you. Based on our uh, meeting on the 15th, um, 
th th there's some revisions I think that Sonia is referring to that are um, really helpful to see the full scope of, of the audit committee for 2020. Um, the IT systems assessment, uh, we had just gone through that when I joined the board um, two years ago and, and um, it seemed at the time that it was really focused on um, cyber uh, security um, and some physical security. And I'm just wondering exactly what the scope is going to be in 2020 and then how we go about uh, procuring that work, if whether or not right. that's a, um, a vendor that we already have or do we uh, go out and procure it just for this audit? Right. So our plan is to basically, um, as the years go by, alternate between the two different types of assessments, the one that we did before. I know the term sort of cybersecurity got bandied about. Technically, it was a network security uh, audit, which looked at all the various uh, hardware and configuration of all of our hardware components. Uh, what is going to happen now is a application security assessment, which will look at all the physical the configuration and settings of all of our applications uh, and look for risks there. And the, the plan is that those two types of audits uh, of security assessments will alternate uh, between each other. The, the cost of the network security assessment was in the uh, neighborhood of $200,000. That was procured through a competitive bidding process, a formal RFP, um, and we will do the same uh, for the application security. So we do not have any sort of vendor lined up for that yet. And Steve, you have, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the time frame. I, I, is this reasonable that, that um, between now and summer 2020 that we're going to be able to procure it, have the work done, and bring it to the board by the winter of 2020? I'm just trying to figure out if we're online with uh, the expectation around that. Um, well, th that is our, that is the timeline that we have built in based on looking at all the other projects that are sort of in the IT uh, pipeline. We do think it is reasonable um, at the moment. Once the assessment itself gets started, it's about a sort of a two month concentrated process. And certainly the way the network assessment, or it, it's not just like sort of one and done, there's, there's remediation work happening while it's going, uh, while it's going on. Okay. So we do think that schedule, at least at the moment, fits in with the sort of the project pipeline that we have developed for all the various IT initiatives underway. And if I could make one comment, the, and I think this was the discussion at the audit committee as well, is the bottom one, the review of prior um, audits, and I think that was a big, big item that we plan to bring back also in a April, May of sort of the follow-up of the audit that you were just talking about, Josh, on the system stuff, but coming back and giving progress on that, as well as progress on some of the other audits, specifically the state audit. So that's that bottom date as well. So. Um, okay, and then lastly, just um, for clarification, on the business continuity plan, which is something that, uh, review, which is something that we uh, discussed on the 15th, um, my understanding is that's something that staff is working on now, um, and, then, and then we'll report back and we can then monitor from there. Right. What we did uh, last year, um, we assigned someone uh, this project to assess various um, systems and methodologies. We evaluated many things. We procured a system called the Fusion Framework System, which is both an IT application and it comes with a methodology for business continuity. So that system was uh, set up and configured. We did work with all the offices on uh, what they call the business impact analysis of various uh, critical uh, critical business processes, and those have been loaded into the system. The, the plan now for the first quarter of this year is to uh, formally stand up that system, get everyone trained on it, make sure it is completely filled out. A concurrent activity is additional work now that needs to happen on emergency response and disaster recovery, specifically related to IT systems and uh, facilities. Okay, great. Thank you, Josh. Um, Steve, do we have the copy of that uh, business continuity in the system, or is it something that can be made available to us? Uh, not yet. It's been <coughs> just the person who uh, is, has been in charge of managing the project has gotten it stood up. It has, it's not formally sort of uh, ready for prime time yet. That's the goal for this quarter, and so it will be a system that is available. Key people will have access to the system, and we will be able to print, you know, uh, the various reports and other things that, that But from what you have last time, you still have that? Are we talking about the business continuity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just procured the system and configured the system initially this year. It's not yet rolled out. That's the plan for for this year. I have sort of um, there are you know various slides and things that sort of explain what the system is, and I could certainly provide uh, that. But what do we have in place right now for the current one? I mean, we I know that we're doing this new. Um, 
Right. I mean, we have not, I mean, historically, we have, you know, IT has its own sort of emergency response plans. The facilities folks in general services have their own emergency response plans. The bar in aggregate has never had before kind of a, a really a formal business continuity plan that would fully address all critical operations. We had components of that here and there. Individual offices do have things like that. Admissions has plans for things that happen with the bar exam, for example. We did a very preliminary version of a kind of an emergency response plan modeled after what the Judicial Council did back in uh, 2016 or so, um, which included plans for potential uh, you know, labor strike when we were in the middle of, of negotiations. That was kind of a, a leading uh, motivation for that. But we have never had before, and this is an, an acknowledged weakness, we have never had kind of a comprehensive organization-wide business continuity plan, and that is the, the goal for this initiative. And so this is the? Yes. For, okay. In the meantime, you're using the judicial, the, the uh, a certain uh, continuity plan for for the overall the office, not just the sectors. I mean, again, there is no, there is no, there is no existing, and this is this is just a, an acknowledged weakness at the organization. We have not had a single comprehensive plan. Individual offices. Uh, have individual plans to address things, including the facilities folks and the IT folks. But there's nothing, there is no comprehensive the state bar's business continuity plan uh, that exists uh, right now in, in that comprehensive form. That is the initiative underway. I think, um, uh, Steve, I think what uh, Sonia is, th there was a little bit of confusion, um, I think, in your earlier statement when you said that you started looking at it in the fall. And I think um, what I understand now is that you are, uh, have this new system and you are intending to bring a holistic continuity plan for uh, uh, review and oversight. Um, I guess what I would ask is, um, as an oversight body, it does make us a little uncomfortable, and I'm sure everybody else at the same time. And so to the extent that maybe we could create uh, just an idea of what those individual plans are by department mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and present that so that at least we can see what's in place today, mm -hmm. Um, that might be helpful for us. Sure. Okay. Sonia, would that thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm you? a little bit concerned that there is not a you know for for the whole office and it's just individual. Um, oh, we are concerned as, as well. That that's the motivation <laughs> right. behind this uh, initiative. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, any additional questions? Um, I'm good for that. Yes. Okay. Um, do we need a motion? We do. We have a resolution for the the committee, which is to adopt, um, and if it was modified, the 2020. Um, That's this finance committee. Oh. It should be audit. It's OK. Just replace finance with audit. But there is one for audit as well. There. No, that's rad. So then I move, I, I can move to, res, um, to adopt the, um, the, uh, the, the audit committee adopts the audit committee 2020 work plan as presented. Second. <laughs> Thank you. Unanimous. Quorum. <laughs> um, okay, I believe that's all we have for business. Um, that'll conclude the uh, audit committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, finance. Right on time.
Okay. Um, let's see. Yep. Calling to order the finance committee meeting. Looks like. Do we need to call roll? Can I just see that everybody's here? Technically, yes. You call. Okay. All right. Let's call the roll. Brand. Here. Rotten. Here. Lorenz. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Great. Okay, um, before we begin, are there any public comments? Hearing none. Um, then we will move on to review of the metrics. And we have John Adams. Yes, good after or good morning, I should say. I'm already getting ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> Wishful so, thinking, John. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's 4 o'clock. Um, so three, item 3A three, three is the, um, just the review of metrics um, that are under the purview of the Finance Committee. And so the staff report that was provided to the board or to the committee really highlights the two metrics. Um, one is in finance and the other one is in HR. Um, the two metrics, one is our reporting within 20 days, um, providing financial reports within 20 days of the close of the month. Um, and that and that target has not been met. Um, our average right now is about 35 to 38 days. Um, as highlighted in the report, um, as we are doing a new system implementation, we would um, our plan is to be able to meet this target um, going forward um, in the summer of uh, 2020. The next metric um, that is out there is performance um, evaluations and completion within 30 days of due dates for employees. Um, just to sort of note, um, the target is 100%. Evaluations are done within 30 days of the due date. Um, for October, um, that number was 63%, and in November improved to 77%. Um, this is certainly positive in the right direction, as in the past it's been under 50%. Um, as noted, um, performance evaluations of both um, executive staff and managers and merit increases are tied to meeting that goal. And so that hopefully will have a um, positive impact on meeting the target. And with that, that's really the two metrics that are monthly that are provided to this committee. Um, the December, the fourth quarter, and annual metrics will be provided to this committee at its next meeting um, sometime in late February or early March. And with that, that is my presentation on the performance metrics. Thank you. Any questions for John? <coughs> I have a question. Oh, yes. So what accounts for the, uh, you know, not getting 100% participation in the uh, you know, I, is at, it, um, Yeah, at the end of the day. Vacation or anything like no, that? No, it's, um, it's just workload. I mean, at the end of the day, um, a lot of managers and supervisors and executives, um, they're, they, they have full plates. And so it's not a good excuse, but um, it is, um, you know, people that are supposed to be writing evaluations and monitoring performance and stuff. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's about workload uh, as far as performance metrics. Little, little quick break between committees. <laughs> How are you? You did. Whoever's on the phone. Someone on the phone may need to mute, please. Sonia, you were talking about performance um, evaluations. Right. Yeah. It's but then it's tied to their compensation or, or their income. Yeah, so last, uh, for, executive, for executive merit increases. You're on the phone. Please mute. It does have an impact on it's being tracked by you know each office and each each manager, so that is reflective in their evaluations and and impacts merit increases. So is this only a one way evaluation, not uh, having a self assessment? The, the employees currently, not having a self assessment. Currently, for well, um, employees, there's an option for self assessment by employees that they can. Some offices and managers employ um, self. Um, self-evaluations for their staff, um, but it's not a 360 in that true sense. So, Renee, I'm a little bit confused. Why it's not 100 percent? Or yeah, I I <laughs> agree. It's you know it's an issue. I'm not sure that it's necessarily um, 
I, I think there's kind of a larger, you know, a larger question. And I think, especially while we're in transition with CEO, that's going to be a difficult um, one. Because this is at the, this is at all levels or just at the manager level. Well, any supervisor. I mean, this okay. this percentage is across yeah, the board. So okay. supervisors, managers, yeah. executives, chiefs, even. Yeah. So, I I I I shouldn't make any excuses. It's I think we all yeah. agree that timely evaluations for employees is critical, and and for managers and supervisors, um, it has been expressed. It's your top priority, right? At the end of the day, to perf to manage staff um, and to evaluate and provide feedback. So. Um, I will tell you at least that was a huge focus for the prior ED executive director and, and Donna shares the same perspective. Yeah. So um, our goal is 100% and it shouldn't be anything less. Yeah. I mean, if I think there was a period where the reviews it, it, hadn't 20, even been 20, done for a yeah. long time. So <laughs> uh, this, you know, this is an improvement, not that we shouldn't continue to get better, but I don't know if Donna, if you want to comment. Uh, certainly, I, I, I agree with, with all of that. I think we have made a significant improvement in the, in the past several years on this. I think there were years where performance evaluations simply weren't done. Um, but as John said, our goal needs to be, one, that we are giving feedback to employees throughout the year. Um, and one of those tools to do that is this annual performance evaluation, which we absolutely need to strive to get done timely for all levels of staff. One of the things that we actually implemented um, recently going forward is for all executives, so uh, chiefs and directors and managers, if we do not get our the uh, performance evaluations in for the people who are, who are our direct reports, then uh, we are not eligible for a merit increase um, that coming year. So we have to we have to meet the the maximum 60 days from the di from the due date from the anniversary date in order to get that in, um, because we are committed to making sure that we do make this a top priority. Thank you. And John, what is the um, what is the go live date? And I said sometime in. Yeah, so the, what's the, yeah, so the go a live. More precise? Yeah, c currently our go live is uh, March 2nd. Um, I think part of any go live is uh, certainly the transition and then ultimately the challenge going from one system to the next and closing the books and everything else. Um, I sort of give us a target of the summer mainly to know the system, to be able to do bank reconciliations. Um, bank reconciliations are usually done within 25 days currently. Um, the new system will speed that up a lot, and we should be able to produce reports, um, you know, in that range of 20 days. So I would um, anticipate this summer is what I'm sort of shooting for, but um, we'll see how it goes. Great. Any other questions on the metrics before we move on to the work plan? Then let's move on to the work plan. So the second item, uh, 3B, is discussion of the um, 2020 Finance Committee work plan. The annual adoption by the committee ultimately will go to the executive committee for approval later this, uh, later this morning. Um, as you, most of you may know, is the Finance Committee was revised this year, um, reduced in scope just to manage the finance component, finance policies, budget, um, and if you remember, it also included planning um, in the past, and so those um, annual items have been um, taken away from this uh, work plan. So just going through the, the work plan, I know I won't spend too much time on it. Um, a lot of these things are reoccurring. Um, anything related to policy updates, certainly the investment policy will be brought to the committee um, for any changes. Um, there are other policies that we will update on a regular basis. I listed a couple that may be reviewed this year. Um, the annual budget process, um, we had our finance committee, I think it was uh, December 20th, to talk about the preliminary budget and receive feedback from the committee. So the committee, um, that's the time frame for this year for the 2021 budget. Also quarterly reports are presented to the committee, which I will do, give you um, an update on a quarterly basis on our conditions, financial condition. And then the last three is really just that aspect of uh, metrics, reviewing um, board initiatives, that have a financial impact, um, and then communication on uh, what is important on um, our finances. So with that, um, it's pretty routine um, when compared to last year. So with that, if I'm 
available for any questions. Any questions? Nope. Doesn't sound like it. So there is a, uh, a motion needed and a resolution which Linda has put up, which is just for the committee to adopt the Finance Committee work plan for 2020. Um, and then again, it goes to the Executive Committee. I move adoption of the work plan for 2020. Any opposed? Any comments? Further comments? Hearing none, we're adopted. Anything else we need? No, just uh, not at this point. I mean, I, I think the one comment is, you know, we also change this, the, the schedule for the committee as far as being ad hoc and scheduled that it, this is at least right now the only one that would be scheduled during a board meeting and any other committee meetings would be more on an ad hoc basis based mm -hmm. on things like the performance metric review and the financial reports. So I will be scheduling those um, well in advance of the needed dates. Great. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. Right, Rad will convene at about 9.35, so if people want to take a quick break, but then if we could have uh, members of Rad come forward when you're ready.
All right. My name is Brandon Stallings. I'm the chair of the Regulation and Discipline Committee. To my right is Ruben Duran, and I uh, want to welcome you to the uh, RAD meeting, the first one in 2020. I uh, just want to briefly thank uh, my vice chair, Ruben, for uh, standing in for me in the last meeting and uh, being called in at the last minute. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, we're going to take a uh, roll and then uh, we're going to have a brief introduction of our new 2201 administrator, and then we'll go immediately into closed. And closed session, uh, I think it's going to be about 15 minutes. Is that correct? Okay, 15 minutes, and then we'll go back into uh, open with the uh, public comment. And I understand we have one individual seeking uh, to give us public comment. So, uh, Lisa, can you give us uh, the roll call, please? Stalling? Stalling? Oh, yes. Here, yeah, I'll start with you. Okay. Chen? Cisneros? Here. Dela Cruz? Duran? Present. Iglesias? Here. LeBron? Here. Manning? Here. Pratula? Here. Soleil? Here. Steinbrecher? Here. All right. Looks like we have quorum here. So I'm going to hand it over to my vice chair, uh, Ruben. Thanks, Brandon. Just very quickly wanted to uh, inform the committee and, and the public that uh, we have successfully recruited a stellar uh, Rule 2201 administrator. Um, and I will allow him to introduce himself in more detail. Uh, his name is Jeff Del Cerro. You see him there at the end of the table. Before I hand the mic over to him, I do want to thank uh, Vanessa Horton, our general counsel, and uh, her colleague and, and, and co-worker, Carissa Anderson, who were uh, very critical in assisting, um, assisting me in, in vetting candidates and conducting interviews. I will tell uh, the committee that it was, um, it was a rigorous process, and we had uh, several very well-qualified candidates. Uh, Jeff just rose to the top as a natural fit, and I think, as you'll see uh, from his presentation, he's got a great energy for the bar and for the work of the 2201 program. And so with that, I will uh, hand it over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Duran. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, maybe you should leave the adjectives for a little bit later in my term. I'm 23 days on the job, but I'm enjoying it immensely. I uh, have had warm greetings here uh, from staff, uh, from members of the board. And uh, as I said, I uh, am happy to be here. I was a, for the bulk of my career as a lawyer, uh, after serving briefly in a few positions, including as a deputy district attorney, I uh, spent the bulk of my career at the bar. I started as a deputy trial counsel, uh, rose through the ranks, and was uh, eventually a manager in ACTC, uh, uh, responsible for the work of the San Francisco Office of the Chief Trial Counsel. Um, I loved my job. Uh, I left uh, as a very happy uh, bar employee. Uh, I believe deeply in the mission of the office. I saw through my career many uh, concrete examples of how a successful attorney prosecutor's office can be helpful to members of the public in getting a little bit of justice when they've been mishandled by members of our profession. So I'm happy to be doing that again. Um, I am looking forward to getting to know uh, the members of the board that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, although I already have some of them, and uh, thank you for your graciousness. Uh, and I look forward to being uh, of service to you in the future. Uh, I'm available to you anytime when you have questions. Feel free to call or send me an email. Uh, I enjoy that kind of interaction, and I am committed to uh, accountability as I perform my job. So thank you, and I'll uh, silence myself until closed session. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, um, we are now going to go into closed session. So that is pursuant to Government Code Section 11126 sub C sub 2. This should last between 15 and 20 minutes. And we'll see everybody on the other side.
All right, this is Brandon Stallings, Chair of the Regulation and Discipline Committee. We are out of closed session, back into open session, and I think we need to take roll call once again. So, Lisa? Stalling? Here. Chen? Cisneros? Here. Dela Cruz? Here. Duran? Here. Iglesias? Here. LeBron? Here. Manning? Here. Pertula? Here. Soleil? Here. Steinbrecher? All right, we have a quorum. I'll move into a call for public comment. I understand there is at least one individual uh, who wishes to address uh, this body on agenda item, I believe it's uh, 2A. And if there's anybody else who wishes to address uh, this uh, body on any of the agenda items, uh, please identify yourself at this time. Hello, and thank but, you for- uh, Sir, just, oh. just a sec. Right, is there any, anybody else on the line or uh, in the audience who wishes to address? Rad. Okay, seeing none, we'll move to our first uh, public commenter. So please uh, identify yourself and uh, how, we, how may we be of service. Okay, thank you for having me today. My name is James Bloom. I'm a United States Marine with an honorable discharge. I also served in the Army National Guard when my country called me back again. And over the age of 50, the Navy called me, so I served in the Navy Reserves. Um, so I've been through three government services and I'm a former law enforcement officer. So. Uh, just want to give you a little background there, and I got an AA degree and a bachelor's degree. But I see things differently. I'm kind of an odd guy. Um, like, for example, you kind of mentioned it yesterday, just to paraphrase, just to show where we're at. So try and follow my meanings, my comparisons, because this is where I'm standing right at this present time. Uh, for example, you said yesterday uh, that you have rules, and then there are laws. The courts give, you know, use the laws. But the bar rules use rules. And I, use, I look at it like this, and if you could kind of clarify this, because I think there's a kind of a spin. A rule is something of conduct. When you give a rule, it has to do with conduct. But when you go to court, it's a law. Okay, I just want to keep this clear, okay, because I kind of look this up. For example, you guys today will say, what's today? Well, in court and in front of the attorneys, well, today is Friday. That's an order. But you ask me what today is, and I'll say, hey, it's Friday, okay? That's me. I just like to enjoy life, and that's how I see things. When I'm telling you these two frames of mind, it also goes with education, upbringing, and where I live and where you live. So to clarify everything, now going to the VL, and this is what we're talking about, giving those two meanings and those premises. When an attorney files 30 cases, he's not a VL. He's an attorney and he's getting down on something and no one ever calls the attorney a VL. When I file 30 cases, I'm a VL. So I believe that's prejudice and discrimination. But let's take it a step more. Remember, I'm a law enforcement officer. I know the difference. And to me, being a former Marine, everything's black and white. He files 30 cases and I'm filing multiple cases, but here's the pivotal issue. Mine is on one topic. I filed the same exact case twice. Follow this now. My, her my case was heard, and I'll just give it to you, it's BD 317479 in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Now follow this, and I believe the judge to be honest. This judge was honest. His name was, well, I don't have to say, but this commissioner was honest, I liked him. Because being in the military, seeing a lot of people, and being a former police officer, you have to size people up. Is he a suspect or is he a nice guy? Is he going to kill me? Do I have to draw my weapon? I need to size people up. I size this judge up, this judge up and I believe him very be honorable. So he gives a final ruling, but it's a complex case that demands, to me, consolidation. I'll tell you why in a second. By the way, consolidations aren't for the poor. So if you're poor, colored, uneducated, or disabled, you can't use the laws in equity. That's prejudice and discrimination. It kind of bothers me about the bar. Again, you give rules. Rules are made to be broken. There's no, you know, nothing to really back it up. That's why I want a law. So follow me on this because and, I need and your Mr. Help. Bloom, if, if you could uh, wrap things up here. Okay, on the vexatious okay. litigant, here's the problem. <clears throat> like I said, the attorney could file 30 cases. I file about eight or nine. I'm already a vexatious litigant, but I'm not. Because here's the pivotal issue, and follow this. When I'm following my eight or nine, I'm still trying to get my ruling 
on the f original case that it was heard. And to make things more complex, now follow this, the judge orders the attorney to do my paperwork, the same attorney that's representing the opposing party, which is a conflict of interest. Okay, and I can't get this cleared up to this day. Then she files the same exact case in Orange County and they retry the case that took two years over here and it was a complex case. I want to consolidate in Orange County, they refused and they changed the final decision from the Los Angeles Superior Court. So now I got two Superior Courts with the same exact case, double jeopardy, right? But only the decision years is over here, but the attorney wanted more money, so now it's double over here. This is nuts. And the judge even protected me. That's why I like this judge. She says it to the attorney, if you don't like my decision, appeal it. Don't go to another jurisdiction. Go form shopping. And that's what I learned right now. I know I'm going to lose in Los Angeles now because I snitched on this, the process here, just like I'm telling you. So now every time I need something, I go to Orange County, and then I backdoor Orange County. I'm, I'm just trying to backdoor every, every case I do now. I'm not an attorney. I don't have to follow your rules. Unless you make a law, I'll follow it. But I'm getting tired of this because it's interchangeable with you guys, but it's not interchangeable with us. We're getting screwed by this definition of what's happening to me here today. You know, form shopping, trying the same exact case over there. Judge says don't do it. It's still done. So rules can be broken. Laws can't. And even when we try to apply the same exact law in equity, it's, we're not heard. That's why I'm about to file a federal lawsuit for a federal filer's bill of rights. So let me give you an example. McDonald's, being a Marine, I went to Japan, bought a Big Mac. Went to the East Coast, bought a Big Mac. It's always the same. Bought one in Los Angeles, West Coast, East Coast, and in Japan. But not here. Every court's different. And when that person retried the same case in Orange County, it was changed. When the judge protected me and says, you don't like my decision, appeal it. You right. could get around to everything. Can you do something about it? Sir, um, had about five minutes. Is there any uh, brief comments that you wish to make uh, to sum up your, uh, your yes, public comments? Yes, why am I a vexatious litigant when I did nothing wrong? And even the judge hired the opposing attorney to do my paperwork. Right. Is there a rule for that? I'm just asking. Is there? You're supposed to watch over me. You guys are my heroes. Now look, I was in the Marine Corps. I got two bullets in my body and I was a police officer. Got assaulted many times. I got spit on. I didn't beat the hell out of this guy. My job was to take it. Your job now is to watch my back. Your job is to give me constitutional rights, constitutional laws, constitutional behavior, which you don't do. Double jeopardy is illegal. The 14th Amendment's there, due process. There's no due process in California. I'm telling you now, there isn't. That's why you give bar rules. I don't like that. I wish you'd make it into bar laws. All right, sir. Well, thank you so much for your service to our thank country, you. and thank you for your public comment today. Thank you. Appreciate I it. wish you'd do something and help us. Protect us. Watch over us, sir. That's all I'm asking, like I did for you. All right, thank Come you, in. sir. All right, anybody else wish to uh, make public comment? All right, uh, move on to uh, the chair's report. Um, I want to thank again Ruben Durand for uh, his significant amount of work uh, over the past couple of months on the 2201 administrator issue, um, our fearless staff le headed by Lisa Chavez, and then uh, all the employees who uh, bring uh, together the work of this RAD uh, committee. It's the largest committee. We have a lot going on. And I just wanted to talk just briefly about uh, some of the things that uh, Ruben and I have been involved in. And I think um, in our discussions with uh, Melanie and Steve about the important work that the Office of OCTC is, um, is engaged in and bringing about the fair administration of justice, uh, we're always looking at ways to improve that. Um, one of the significant things we've been working on is the new case management system, uh, Odyssey, and as has been discussed in the past, um, this system captures a vast amount of data, data that we can use uh, to further uh, the efficiency of uh, the Office of OT OCTC, and then also increase our uh, transparency and uh, give better uh, reports to our various stakeholders. Uh, as you can imagine, though, with the more data you collect, the longer it takes, and the more training um, is required to make sure that uh, that data is captured correctly. So those are uh, things that we are working on in OCTC. I want to thank the employees for their flexibility and for the initiative that they take every single day uh, in order to uh, learn this system and to make it even uh, better. Um, the fingerprinting uh, data that we're receiving has been voluminous and uh, we have dedicated staff 
to working through uh, that data and to make uh, further uh, decisions on what to do. Um, what's of note is those cases uh, move directly into state bar court and then we are under time constraints on that. So uh, Melanie and Steve are uh, working to uh, streamline that process. One of the significant um, things that we worked on last year was the online portal and increased access to justice for individuals who uh, may not have been able to mail uh, items in um, and it really increased uh, our reach out into the community to make sure that we can efficiently protect the public uh, by uh, receiving online complaints. With increased access, we've definitely seen the increase in the amount of complaints and um, just how those complaints are processed with the data that's um, retrieved from the online portal. So we continue to work through and to make that uh, process efficient. Um, one of the continuing things, and we touched on a little bit, is the uh, uh, recruitment of a diverse workforce, both here in Los Angeles and then also in San Francisco. So we continue to uh, onboard new employees and to make sure that we get employees that uh, really capture the mission of the, of the state bar. Uh, so um, with the increase in, in uh, funding, when we eventually um, are able to, f to have those positions and then fill them, uh, we are uh, dedicated to making sure that that onboarding process gets these new employees um, into the uh, workflow and the work stream as uh, quickly as possible. And then the last thing I want to talk briefly about is case prioritization. One of the uh, visions that Steve had when he came to the state bar was to make sure that the cases that had the greater uh, risk of harm to the public are the ones that we spend the most time on and the most resources and that uh, continues to, uh, to happen. So um, those are some things going on with um, what Ruben and I track in the office of uh, uh, with the Chief Trial Counsel. Uh, we uh, also meet regularly with the State Bar Court and Defense Bar through the uh, Bench Bar Coalition. And uh, we appreciate the collaborative approach that is taken with all stakeholders in regards to the uh, fair and efficient uh, administration of justice. Um, while not technically under RAD, um, Mark uh, Broughton and myself um, are uh, working with the Office of Probation and with the uh, State Bar Court in regards to the uh, attorney supervision and assistance um, redesign. So that's the re redesign of the probation department and we look forward to having some more data to you in March uh, regarding uh, some of those. It really is a massive undertaking. I think sometimes with, uh, with terms and with acronyms um, doesn't seem like there's a lot going on, but this is a massive project that has very real implications on how we um, rehabilitate individuals who have harmed the public. So it's an exciting project, and if you have any input to give Mark and I, please, uh, please see us after the session. So that is my oral report, and we'll move to uh, the consent agenda. There are three items on the consent agenda. Uh, is there any objection to any of, or does anybody wish to have uh, those items pulled off for further discussion? All right, and seeing no objection, um, is there any objection to substituting the roll call? Okay, they will be deemed approved. Going on to business, uh, item A, we have Andrew Tuft doing uh, double duty here or triple, I'm not sure how many. So Andrew's gonna present on the uh, revised rules of professional conduct and uh, their return from public comment. And this is a request for adoption by the board. So we will be voting at the end of the presentation. All right, so Andrew, take us away. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Tuft. I'm the supervising attorney in the Office of Professional Competence. And in this role, I uh, serve as staff counsel to the State Bar Standing Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct. Um, what I'm passing around is a revised attachment D. It's not substantive. Uh, staff made a uh, clerical error when we uh, posted the attachment. I dropped off uh, comment six, which is an existing comment. Uh, to Rule 1.16, uh, 
and by no means, if you agree to uh, approve the revision that's being requested here, we, I do not wish at all to have any misunderstanding that we are uh, not retaining comment six. Um, so what's being passed around is uh, the exact same attachment and the suggested revisions that were in the postage and the item and that you have. All it does is add the existing comment six, something that we're not discussing today. Um, but I just want the record to reflect um, if, we, if uh, RAD agrees to approve the rule as revised, uh, we wish to retain existing comment six. Uh, so this <coughs> item is a request uh, for uh, RAD um, to approve and recommend the board do the same, uh, recommending revisions um, to two rules of professional conduct. Uh, just taking a step back, in order for a rule of professional conduct to become operative under Business and Professions Code Section 6077, it needs to be, a rule needs to be adopted by the board and approved by the Supreme Court. So there are two uh, resolutions with respect to this item, and that would be to adopt uh, the revisions that are being recommended and to direct staff uh, to request that the board approve uh, these revisions. And um, some of you may recall, I was before you back in September. This item comes from uh, Assembly Bill 1987, which was signed into law in September of 2018. Assembly Bill 1987 uh, was a bill that expanded a defendant's right, uh, a defendant's right to access post-conviction -dis discovery materials in cases where the defendant is convicted of a serious or violent felony resulting in a sentence of 15 years or more. Previously, the law allowed, po allowed post-conviction discovery for uh, convictions of death or life without parole. Uh, as part of that uh, assembly bill, there's an uncodified section which asked the state bar to study whether the rules are sufficiently clear with uh, post-conviction file retention rights, or, or duties rather. And um, back in September of last year, uh, the co-chairs of RAD assigned COPRAC to study this issue. They did, there's a, their report is one of the attachments, and um, they are recommending, um, well, when we went out for public comment, they recommended that three rules be revised. Um, uh, the, a comment be added to Rule 1.16, which is the termination of representation rule, to state that under certain circumstances, statutes may require the attorney to retain a file for the term of the client's imprisonment. That is what the revision to, uh, that's what the revision of Assembly Bill 1987 uh, made operative uh, in the penal code. And then they also amended um, Rule 3.8, which is special duties of a prosecutor. Uh, there is a current penal code section which requires prosecutors to take steps um, before um, uh, destroying or, or doing away with certain exhibits and biological evidence. And um, there's also case law which says um, if an order is so imposed, prosecutors have an obligation to comply with um, uh, preservation orders of evidence in certain circumstances. So those were the revisions to those two rules. Uh, the committee also recommended a revision to the uh, communication with clients rule. Um, and the reason for that is uh, there is a subpart to the communication with current client rule which says in certain circumstances you don't have to disclose information to a current client if it might require the client to become upset. Um, so it gives the lawyer some discretion, whereas in other circumstances, communication is mandatory and must be done in a reasonable um, manner as soon as reasonably possible. And there's a comment to that rule which says, but this does not uh, change your duty to um, give the client their file at the termination of representation. Please see Rule 1.16. And so the committee thought, okay, let's add uh, the comment to Rule 1.16, which also says in certain circumstances, because they're citing to two penal code sections in the comment to Rule 1.16. I'm really sorry if this is uh, boring, but uh, I just want to make sure we got uh, all of this from top to bottom. Um, 1.16, there's a comment there that says, in um, certain circumstances, the penal code prohibits you from giving the client, a criminal client, um, certain forms of evidence, such as uh, contact information for a witness, um, pornographic evidence uh, in a certain cases, and now that we're adding uh, an obligation to uh, retain files on criminal matter, we thought, oh, well, maybe we should uh, do a cross-reference to the termination of uh, representation rule because there's a similar cross-reference to the uh, 
uh, to that rule in the communication with current client rule. And we got a helpful public comment which says, if you're going to do a cross-reference in the communication with current client rule, maybe you should explain why you're cross-referencing to comment five. And so they said, okay. The committee said, okay, let's uh, try to describe why we're going to do the cross-reference. And once they started to undertake that um, task, they realized the cross-reference um, would only lend confusion to the practicing, or there's a great risk that could lend confusion to the practicing, um, practicing lawyers. Um, the duty to retain files uh, when the representation is over is separate than the duty to communicate with a current client. So um, three suggested revisions went out for public comment. They are uh, requesting that you adopt two of those, the special duty uh, prosecutor revision to a comment of that rule, as well as the comment to um, termination of representation rule, and um, they are withdrawing the recommendation for a cross-reference to Rule 1.4. If you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, address it. I apologize for the long-windedness of that description. Okay. Are there any questions for Mr. Mr. Tuff? Yes, Sean. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'll move adoption of the item. Okay. So first by Sean, second by Debbie. Is there any further discussion? All right. May I substitute the roll call? All right. Seeing no objection, is approved. Thank you for your work. Thank you all. All right. We'll move to item B, review of metrics for offices within regulation and discipline committee purview and discipline system statistical report. So more stats. We love stats and we love how they're presented. So Lisa. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Lisa Chavez and I'm the director of the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability and I also coordinate uh, the RAD committee. Um, today I'm going to be reporting out on two items. Um, one, the metrics that are under the RAD committee's purview that did not meet the performance targets. And two, uh, a little overview of the January 2020 Discipline System Statistical Report that is attachment A to this agenda item. So let's, let's start first with the metrics. Um, so as a reminder, um, we have a set of metrics that the State Bar has across all, most of the offices within the organization. And <clears throat> the 2019 October and November monthly met metrics report has been been submitted to the Board of Trustees as an attachment to Donna's Executive Director's report. So that report contains all the metrics that we track on a monthly basis. In that report, there are eight metrics under the RAD Committee's purview that have performance targets, and four did not meet them, and that's what I'll be discussing right now. So two, two metrics uh, related to OCTC did not meet their targets. <clears throat> One is the metric to maintain the annual caseload clearance rate of 1.0 or higher. Uh, the data showed that in October and November, um, the, those uh, results were 0.94 and 0.95 respectively, so very close to the target but not meeting it quite yet. <clears throat> and ultimately, the drastic increase in the number of cases that OCTC received last year and the February go live of the Odyssey case management system has continued to impact case processing. And OCTC continues to refine the case management system processes and adjust to these system capabilities. A second metric did not uh, meet its target, and that relates to the complaint review unit. And uh, the metric reads, maintain current level of complaint review unit reopens for reasons other than new evidence. The target is 4%, and the October-November performance was 2 and 7% respectively. So the reason why the metric uh, was higher than the target in November was because one complaint that was reopened um, involved three separate attorneys, and therefore it's counted as three cases. So if that case was counted as one case, that metric's value would have been 4% and would have met the target. So given the small number of cases that are re actually reopened by the case review unit, um, complaint review unit, um, we're gonna reevaluate this metric and instead consider reporting it out on a quarterly or an annual basis. And then finally, there's two metrics related to state bar court having to do with whether or not cases received, received, uh, reached final outcome within established timelines, and uh, they did not meet those targets, and so staff reviewed those cases, and they determined that the case processing delays were caused by factors outside of the state bar's control. So does anyone have any questions about uh, the metrics? 
related to the rad to uh, to rad offices, offices that are under rad's purview. Yeah. Okay. Anybody All have right. any questions? I, Steve and Melanie are here in the oh. room, so not to draw them up if you don't need to. <laughs> are there any uh, questions? Okay, so, okay, so I'm, I can now. Okay, so now I'll move on to uh, discuss the discipline system statistical report. Again, this is attachment A for this uh, agenda item. So my office issues this bi, bi monthly uh, report, and many of the charts will look familiar to you because uh, many of them reflect the metrics that are reported in the metrics report. But I want to make sure that we understand how this report differs from the metric report that is attached to Donna's executive report. So the metrics report reflects, like I mentioned, um, data that we collect on offices across the entire state bar. In contrast, the discipline statistical report has, only, has metrics for offices that are under the purview of RAD, like OCTC, state bar core, probation, et cetera. The metrics report focuses primarily on comparing the most recent data that's available on a metric to a target that was set for that metric. And in contrast, the, our, our uh, DSSR report contains data up to 13 months of data. The DSSR ultimately, the goal for this report is to give context to the metrics. So for example, one metric we have is to minimize backlog cases that are priority one cases. So if you look at the metrics report, it shows the percent of all backlog cases that were priority one cases over time. The DSSR has charts that show details like total number of cases that were in backlog, and number of priority one cases, number of priority two cases. Again, for 13 months. So it's giving context to that metric. And then finally, uh, the DSSR, for those who've already looked at it, uh, it contains analyses that go beyond the metric. So for example, we have the data on recidivism rates. Um, we'll be adding the additional analyses that Ron shared yesterday. And all the analyses that Dag shared yesterday with regard to the complaining witness survey are also in that report. So this report is a work in progress um, in the sense that we are open to adding material as requested by this committee, by the board, um, and our goal, I'll just close with this, is to put this online in dashboard format. Uh, this will be more accessible to you all and also for the public. All right, are there any questions for Lisa? Any uh, comments on data that you would like to see or the manner in which you would like to see it? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I think we can now go to our last agenda item, which is uh, 3C. And that's the discussion and adoption of the 2020 Regulation and Discipline Committee Work Plan. And so Lisa and I were talking about a work plan and really what it means in the context of RAD. Um, so we have our strategic plan, which uh, gives the framework from which uh, we operate as um, as an oversight committee and the work plan is really uh, a chance for rad to uh, members of rad uh, to look at um, different uh, projects that are coming up things that we have on our calendar such as the annual discipline report and to make sure that we as a committee are tracking uh, things that um, the staff is working on and kind of give us a little bit more of a uh, in the weeds approach uh, to making sure that we're uh, doing what we need to do. So um, has everybody had a chance to look at the 2020 RAD uh, work plan? Anybody not had a chance to look at it? So if you could uh, just pull it up. We're not going to do a line by line um, unless uh, anybody in the committee would like to, but it, does anybody have any objections to uh, any of the items or any questions about any of the items that are contained in the work plan. Okay, seeing none. Um, yesterday we engaged in a lengthy uh, discussion during our planning session about uh, the Farkas report, uh, about uh, recommendations uh, from uh, Professor Robertson, and uh, I think that there was a lot of uh, maybe some questions that did not go uh, or that, that went uh, unasked just because of uh, time constraints. And so uh, what I want to propose to this committee is that 
Uh, we continue to study the different recommendations. We continue to study um, some of the uh, issues brought up in the report and potentially include those as a portion of our uh, work plan. And so I think what might be helpful for staff is if we go through the 10 recommendations, um, I know Melanie and Steve have some thoughts uh, that they have on some of the recommendations um, to uh, further inform the board. And so if we could have some of those thoughts, so Melanie and Steve, if you guys wanna come up right now, And what we could do right now is if we could go kind of line by line, and I want to give Melanie and Steve an opportunity just to give us some preliminary information if further study and further reports are needed for March, which is when I would anticipate this coming back for approval, uh, that we can have those reports and hopefully send out a little bit ahead of time so you guys can review them. So um, anybody disagree with that approach? Okay, we're going to go on to uh, item one the uh, reportable actions relating to bank, uh, uh, to the banks. And so, Melanie and Steve, I don't know if, uh, who wants to take uh, A and B, just to provide us some background. Sure, well, I guess I'll start. And first of all, we welcome the opportunity and, and we met with, uh, individually with Professor Robertson and, and he was uh, very kind and, and asked a lot of very good questions. And, and I think that was uh, interesting and it's gonna be a valuable exercise uh, and hopefully will pay off. Uh, I think that as was mentioned yesterday, he had very limited time with us and with our organization and similarly we've had very little time with his recommendations. <laughs> so uh, all of these I think need to be studied in, in greater detail. But as far as sort of uh, gut reactions to the proposals, uh, I, I, I still think that there's a lot to look at here, uh, but I think there are also are potentially some misunderstandings or misperceptions about the way that we use things. For example, uh, the bank RA, uh, the reportable action from banks that was discussed yesterday, I think part of the concern is that when we get these reportable actions from banks that we then will use those in some way to uh, as a basis for greater discipline when we get some other complaint later on. And, it, and that's really not the way that, we, that those operate. Uh, we look at those individually, we determine whether there is uh, any violation there. Uh, we ask the lawyer for an explanation and if the explanation is reasonable then we leave it alone. Uh, or we give them some guidance, uh, some resources to change their practices, whatever it is, whatever is appropriate. But when we're looking in terms of prior investigations or prior complaints that are filed against somebody, we're really looking at similar conduct to determine whether that's something that we're going to consider in the, in the instant case, as opposed to just this person that has had 10 bank RAs and now they have a failure to communicate, uh, we're really going to throw the book at them so to speak. So I'm not sure that that really came through to Professor Robertson and so that's one thing that we need to discuss with him in analyzing the impacts. Um, as far as the the second issue, the prior record. Uh, Actually, be, before you go on to that, um, are there any questions about the RA issue for Melanie or for Steve? Alan. Yeah, Alan Steinbrecher. Uh, if you get one of these uh, RAs and um, you investigate it briefly and determine that there's nothing to it, do you keep a record of the fact that it, there was one and so you might look back in somebody's file, if you will, and see that there were 20 uh, of these over a 10 year period? You still have that information on hand. We do still have that information. Okay. Now, you know, it's not like just because we get five of these in five years or five in two years uh, that we suddenly say, hey, there's a problem here. We're still going to reach out to them, ask what the situation is, and again, if there's a reasonable response, we're going to leave that alone. Uh, nonetheless, there is some significant concern if money is missing from a client trust account, right? If, if it goes below where it's supposed to go, something is wrong. Either, either money is missing or there are, uh, they're not meeting their obligations to 
hold money until ba until checks cleared and things like that. And obviously, the, as we discussed yesterday, there may be some reasons for that that are outside the bar's control. Uh, but I don't. But it's an open question that we need to look at as to whether we um, ignore that. Uh, you know, just because the bank, for example, honored the check and then issued some small amount of credit. But we need to look into that further. Okay, Josh. Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, appreciate the ability to talk about these um, 10 items, um, uh, and I hope that there'll be another opportunity to do it. I, I was under the impression from yesterday that we were going to have a more methodical approach to this, um, and that there would be uh, information brought back to either RAD or to the board specific to these 10 items, but also to other items as they were thought through for what is a really important issue for this board to, to consider. And so I just want to make sure that's still an opportunity instead of just the gut reaction that we're, we're getting today. Absolutely. So the plan is to bring back uh, clear action items in July. Um, Araya is going to be working long in, in conjunction, I believe, with Professor Robertson and then also with the input of OCTC on uh, these different issues. So this is not the, the final conversation at all. My uh, goal in kind of just walking through briefly the 10 uh, steps to s is to see if anybody had any kind of gut reactions to uh, the 10 proposals. If there's a proposal that this committee strongly feels uh, should not be uh, further looked into, then we d are not going to waste uh, staff's time. If there is kind of a prioritization um, on this committee, maybe like the top three menu items um, that uh, might be the most effective, then we can direct staff to focus maybe a little bit more resources on that. So that's kind of what I envision this discussion being. It's not a exhaustive discussion by any means, uh, but really uh, S Melanie and Steve um, sharing information with the board so that we're not operating on a mistaken belief for the next six months prior to making a decision in, in July. So. Hopefully that clarifies our discussions today. Okay, anything else on one? Uh, well, I guess on one, I, I mean, I'm sort of intrigued by B. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but but I think there that uh, obviously we need to continue to, to explore A, uh, but I think that B is, is also uh, very interesting okay. and maybe a way to, to resolve some of these issues. Okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> Steve, I just had an idea when you were speaking about this, because I think it's also a very intriguing idea of resolving the problem and preventing problems um, in the future. And one idea that's occurred to me that is that you could possibly use agreements in lieu of discipline. You know, if you have someone who has a lot of reportable actions coming in, which is a red flag, that they could resolve any issue by saying, I agree, I'm not sure you can impose it, at least we could consider a rule that would impose it, but I agree to use this service, this bookkeeping service that the bar has approved. Um, to run my trust account, and that and for some period of time, and then that would um, that would definitely avoid harm to the public. And frankly, it may be welcome. I mean, I, if I were a sole practitioner, I think uh, all of these ancillary tasks of doing things like running the trust account are, you know, kind of a challenge. Um, and so, uh, I think it's a really intriguing idea of preventing harm mm -hmm. before it happens. I agree. All right, well, I think that we're in agreement that one is definitely something to focus on for our July recommendations. Okay, uh, going on to two, prior record. Uh, with two, I, I think that Melanie and I need to work with Professor Robertson to sort of see what that would look like and how we could work that into the workflow. Some of the things that we're con concerned about is slowing down the speed of the work. Uh, the, the, that is obviously a significant concern to uh, the public and to our stakeholders and to us. And so we want to make sure that we could accommodate that without slowing that down. The, when you're talking about prioritization, though, I, I mean, I think that, that based on Professor Farkas's report and on uh, Professor Robertson's uh, summary yesterday, the real uh, meat of it is in number three. And that seemed to be the biggest differential, and it seems to drive the outcomes the most. Um, I, I'm not sure... And I appreciated Professor Robertson's statement that he is reporting to the bar, and you uh, are the trustees of the bar, uh, and OCTC is a part of that. But I think that um, perhaps nudging attorneys to get representation and providing other support to non-represented attorneys is a great idea. I'm not sure that that is in the wheelhouse of OCTC, but it definitely is in the wheelhouse of the bar. 
and there may be some things that we could do to uh, to increase representation, et cetera. Again, there's a lot of ancillary things that we need to think about what that would look like and and how we could uh, coordinate that, but uh, that would be important. Okay, so then just, so going back then to two, are there any general questions from the uh, committee to Melanie or Steve on two? Yeah, Sean. I just have a suggestion. So one of the things I mentioned yesterday when the professor was here was uh, looking at standard 1.8. So I would add that to the list, and not prejudging what the outcome would be, but I think his comments said it would be, suggested to me it would be a good idea to look at the standard uh, and whether it's maybe too rigid. All right. And so I, do I get the sense that we're in agreement with putting two through to uh, July? I almost feel like America's got talent here. Putting, putting things through. No golden buzzers. Okay. All right. Um, number three, representation. Any questions for Melanie and Steve? Okay. And again, any strong feelings one way or the other about whether or not that should uh, be passed through? Yeah. Leah said, or yeah. Okay. Renee says, of course. Okay. I'm in agreement. Okay. Number four, uh, the blinding. And so. Any uh, brief comments? This is a, another one that, that Melanie and I are interested to hear how it would operate and how it would, uh, how we can make sure that it doesn't slow down the workflow. And the only other comment that I have at this point is that I believe Professor Robertson, Robertson said that it's probably of limited benefit. That there's, there, isn't, there may not be much payoff to implementing this proposal. Uh, I think we still need to look at it and determine how feasible it is, um, but I don't know whether the potential drag on the workflow is worth the benefit. Okay. Any brief questions? Okay. And any uh, objection to this being passed through to July? Okay, seeing none, that will get passed through. And then uh, staff diversity. I think this is a clear a clear winner. I mean, I think this is something that we need to look at. This is something that we have considered in hiring and promotions, uh, but it's not been a uh, a coordinated effort. It hasn't been studied. We we don't have statistics on the percentage of people in our office that uh, you know belong to each separate group or whatever or claim to be one thing or another. Uh, it's just not something that we've taken on, but there's no reason that we can't. Okay. All right, any questions? Any strong feelings one way or the other on this issue? All right, we'll pass it through to July. Um, okay, any other comments, questions about um, this aspect of the strategic plan? Okay, seeing none, so um, I'm not sure what the uh, committee's uh, direction is if you want to adopt this work plan with the understanding that it could potentially be amended in July. I don't see any harm in doing that. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I'm Josh. still not completely understanding. Um, uh, I understand that these 10 items are to be considered, but um, I don't believe they're to be the full 10 items in the work plan. Right. Isn't the work plan much broader than that? So, yeah, so the, uh, these 10 items were just for today to kind of direct our discussion because we heard about, uh, about them in depth yesterday. And so... Um, this is not precluding any other items from being brought up in July, if that's if I'm understanding your question. Yeah, that's my question. Okay. And, and if I could just clarify too, I think sort of what I'm taking away from this, in, uh, in terms of you know sort of will be brought back in July or put through to July. Um, what what I think we're saying is that these ten items are on the list of things that we will be exploring, whether it be with Professor Robertson or other uh, professionals that we engage with between now and July. Um, we may ultimately not recommend pursuing some of those. Um, Josh and I were actually talking yesterday, and what, what we'll bring to, uh, to the board or to RAD in July will be the list of recommendations, uh, the list of options that we explored and which ones we are recommending move fo we move forward with and which ones we're not recommending we move forward with. This way the board has the uh, ability to have that insight into our decision-making process and should the board feel that one of the items that we chose not to pursue should be something that we're looking at, then we can put that back on the list. Sean. 
So Brandon, since you, <clears throat> since you brought the discussion back to the work plan, it occurs to me that looking at the issues on the screen is not really part of the work plan at the moment. So maybe we should make it part of the work plan because um, we have, we just have agreed to do that. So I would move to adopt the work plan with an amendment that a new item is added along the lines of study recommendations for uh, reforms in light of the Farkas report. All right. Okay, so for who was who did the second? Josh? So we will add that, Lisa, if we could. Um, do we need to amend the uh, resolution? Or can we just say as amended? Okay. Um, and then we will include the specific date. So to the committee, that will be in uh, July of 2020. And then to the board, um, I don't think we have to do that in, ju in July. Or should we leave that July 2020? And then we'll uh, fill in the link to the strategic plan and then the status, and we'll have uh, more of that for, what, what I'll do is I'll bring this back then in March um, so we can flesh out those details during our biweekly calls. Okay, any further discussion on the, um, on the uh, action item? Okay, any objection to substituting the roll call? All right, it will be approved. Thank you so much, and Melanie and Steve for being available. Okay, that concludes the business of RAD, and we are three minutes over, so Alan, sorry about that. The executive committee meeting will start at uh, 1050 in about three minutes.
executive committee to order. Okay, like All right, we are calling the uh, meeting of the executive committee to order. Uh, this is the State Bar of California Board of Trustees executive committee meeting starting. Uh, please call the roll. Uh, Duran. Present. LeBron. Here. Manning. Here. Seleg. Here. And Steinbrecher. All right. Here. All right, uh, we are in open session. Uh, does, is there anyone from the public who would like to address the executive committee on anything that's on the agenda for today? Seeing no one in the room, no one on the telephone, we'll move on. I don't have an oral report. There is nothing on the consent agenda, so we'll go directly to the business. Uh, 3A, and that is Mr. Broughton and Mr. De La Cruz. Where is Mr. Broughton? He was right behind you. Why don't we, Dag, why don't we just skip, skip and go to B? Yeah. Oh, and there's consent agenda. Yeah, there's Does nothing on the consent agenda. Huh? Uh, All right, so we're uh, going to take uh, item 3B out of order. And uh, Dag, go ahead. Item 3B is mine. Uh, item 3B seeks uh, executive committee approval of the revised Board of Trustees policy manual, commonly known as the Board Book. The original Board Book was created in 2004. Over the years, it became something of a warehouse for lost information. It included <laughs> lengthy recitations of statute, detailed historical information about uh, the bar and the board. It included a range of staff policies and procedures. And by 2018, the board book ran to almost 300 pages in length. Um, staff had been directed to pare it down and make it more useful. Um, there are large, a number of large specific changes um, that are highlighted in the uh, agenda item itself, and I'm going to mention a couple of those. But really, the main point of the revision to the board book is to reconceptualize it not as a compendium of all of these different types of information, but rather to make it a concise resource guide for the Board of Trustees. Um, the body of the revised board book after formatting will run to less than 40 pages. Uh, the main changes I wanted to highlight here are, um, and the reason why when we approved the board back book back in March, the revised board book back in March, we withheld a number of items that needed further work. Uh, these are the items that I wanted to highlight in my, my um, remarks here. Uh, Appendix H, it is the largest of the appendices in the book. And it's the one where we've retained complete statutory citations. And this is the appendix that deals with ethics and conflicts of interest. So this will provide a, a single source um, a guide for trustees regarding um, their ethical obligations and potential conflicts of interest. Um, we revised the amicus policy to ensure that there is close coordination between the general counsel and the board in determining whether the bar should, bar should participate as an amicus. Um, and there were significant revisions to Appendix E, and these revisions resulted in part from the, um, the Governance and the Public Interest Task Force Appendix I um, restructuring of our relationship to the sub-entities, but the point of revising Appendix E 
was to look at the very lengthy uh, detailed information regarding each of the sub-entities and to extract from that what was really useful for the Board of Trustees. And in reviewing that material, what we found was that a lot of it was internal operating policies and procedures for specific sub-entities rather than information that would be useful to the Board of Trustees. So that has been pared down to a concise um, listing of the sub-entity duties, the composition of the sub-entities, and the appointing authorities uh, of the sub-entities. Um, there is one um, hanging chad, as, as Leah used to like to refer to these as, one remaining item that um, uh, is going to need to be revisited in the, in the board book, and that has to do with the state bar court. We are in conversation with the state bar court about the, um, the exact statutory citations that we want to include and how we want to characterize um, the relationship between the board of trustees and the state bar court and the relationship between the state bar and the state bar court. Um, so we will be coming back with that, but that's the overview of what, uh, what we're asking the executive committee to approve in terms of revisions. And then the final note that I need to make here is a huge thank you to Sean Saleg. Um, previously, Sean had um, uh, Joanna, Mendez, uh, Joanna Mendoza. Mendoza. Um, Trustee Mendoza was uh, available as his partner in this endeavor to review the work that we were doing. Um, Sean. Um, took it on himself to continue working with me and, and reviewing all of the revisions, looking at um, details of what the changes we were um, proposing. So thank you very much, Sean. Does anyone have any questions? Sean, anything to add? Uh, no, I just want to thank Dag for his careful work on this. A lot of work went into this supplemental piece. And uh, I would welcome hearing a motion to adopt the board book as revised. So moved with thanks to Sean and Dag and Joanna, post not posthumously, but <laughs> retroactively. <laughs> retroactively. <laughs> I know you're watching, Joanna. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Sec second? Okay. Uh, moved by Ruben and seconded by Debbie. Uh, I'll just add my comment, too. I also want to thank uh, everyone on the staff who participated in this, particularly Dag. Uh, who I know, but I know there are others were involved as well, and to Sean for uh, really moving something that's important forward. Uh, one of those often overlooked uh, things that uh, can be very helpful, but if it gets off track like it had become before the revision process began, uh, it's virtually useless. So it's going to be a, a very, very useful tool for the board in the future. And again, I thank you. All right, may I substitute the role? Okay, the motion is passed. Back to 3A. Mark, do you have a report on uh, Lawyer's Assistant Program? Apologize for being a little tardy. I was having a conversation before we came here. In any event, um, technically the liaisons are the one that would present um, the uh, nominees for this committee and others, I believe, to the, to the executive committee for ultimate uh, appointment. And so um, myself and Juan reviewed the applicants for, along with staff, reviewed the applicants for the Lawyers Assistant Program Oversight Committee and we are recommending for appointment um, these individuals which you see in your agenda item. Um, uh, let me go through and make sure I get all of their names correct. Um, James Heiting, Justin Dela Cruz, Kelly Ranasing, and Dr. Martin Williams. I w also mentioned that uh, there apparently is one more open position uh, that when the applicants come in, we'll be reviewing those and then making an appropriate recommendation to the board. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Mark or at all? All right, the uh, chair will entertain a motion to... Um, so moved. Okay. To approve the recommendations. Yep. Ruben. Second. Renee. Second. 
May I substitute the roll? The motion is passed. Thank you. Item C, uh, 3C, approval of the 2020 legislative priorities. Linda Katz. Welcome. Hi, I'm Linda Katz. I work in legislative affairs in the Mission Advancement and Accountability Division. Um, and, and just as a reminder, in January of 2018, the board adopted a legislative program with guiding principles to ensure that the priorities, the BARS legislative priorities were in align alignment with and advance the goals of the strategic plan. So this agenda item presents the 2020 legislative priorities and asks the exe board's executive committee and then the board to approve those priorities. And they are, there's a short description of each of the legislative proposals. Um, and I'm happy to provide a little bit more information. Uh, the first proposal has to do with the elimination of the governance and the public interest task force. Now that we have legislative priorities and we've um, implemented many of the recommendations of prior task forces, um, it seems that the, uh, this task force is redundant to the core functions of the board and the uh, um, and so th there is th there's an interest in eliminating that uh, task force. There are a couple of items having to do with improving the collections program, and we have staff from the Office of General Counsel on the phone if there are questions about those. There are also a couple of items uh, put forward by the Office of General Counsel having to do with um, improving confidentiality or bringing um, uh, further confidentiality with regard to law schools and law students um, and not just applicants to the bar uh, to, to uh, bring those into closer alignment and there are also recommendations to uh, provide further confidential confidentiality with regard to the preparation of the bar exam. So if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them or the Office of General Counsel staff can answer them as appropriate. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Mr. Chair, just one, and, and uh, it may go without saying, but if there are um, new issues or is there's a new issue that arises that would merit the board's consideration as a legislative priority as the year goes on, I'm assuming there's a process for us to amend this list, add to it, take away from it. Um, I'm assuming it's informal, but maybe you could let us know. Sure, yes, although this does have to kind of align with the legislative uh, cycle. So, but, but yes, adding them on and, and getting them uh, up for discussion for sure. That, I think that happened a couple of times last year where there were additional uh, legislative priorities that came up and they were bought, brought to the board for approval before we had worked to advance them. Sean? <clears throat> Thanks, Linda. So on the second proposal related to Section 6060.25, can you elaborate a little bit on the reason for the proposed change? And for that, I'd like to, we have um, uh, Suzanne Grant uh, and Carolyn Holmes on the phone, if you uh, are available to answer that question. I think that was one that Caroline was working on. Good morning. Um, the audio cut out a bit when the question was asked. Do you mind repeating the question? No, not at all. So uh, the second item in our memo regarding section 6060.25, can you elaborate on the reasons for the proposed change? Yes. Um, so currently 6060.25 provides for a prohibition on disclosure of identifying or potentially identifying applicant information, and that would include demographic information, uh, it can include uh, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, other types of sensitive information. Um, this section allows us to withhold that information from disclosure in response to a CPRA request. Uh, the proposed change would apply the same protection of that identifying and potentially identifying information to law students because we do receive demographic and other sensitive type of information about law students uh, through the law school report, annual reporting process. 
Um, so those law students essentially would have the same privacy interest uh, in keeping that information confidential as the applicants do. They just haven't become applicants to the state bar yet um, because they haven't yet registered for a particular exam or they're too early in the process to have, they're too early in their schooling to have registered with the state bar yet. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Any other questions? The chair will entertain a motion to uh, adopt this resolution. Uh, Debbie move. Second. Ruben second. May I substitute the roll? Thank you. The uh, resolutions adopt. Item 3D. Approval of the 2020 board committee work plans. Uh, Dag. The, the final item here is pretty much exactly what you just said. We're seeking executive committee approval of the work plans that have been approved by the audit committee, finance committee, and uh, regulation and discipline committees earlier today. Uh, moved by Renee LeBrand. Did I hear a second? Yes. Uh, Ruben, second. Any discussion? May I substitute the roll? That is adopted. Thank you. That concludes the business of the uh, executive committee. We are now adjourned. The uh, regular uh, session of the entire board of trustees uh, is scheduled to begin at 12 o'clock, so that's when we'll start. Thank you.
schedule a little bit because we are uh, running ahead of time, believe it or not. So we are going to uh, go into open session briefly to take the roll and to announce that we're going into closed. We will go into closed for about half an hour and then we will break for lunch and come back at noon and pick up the regularly scheduled uh, open session. That will give us some headway on the closed session, which we won't have to do all of it this afternoon after the open session is over. All right. So uh, please uh, call the roll. I'm going to call the roll, and Joe's going to shut down the, um, the video link and the audio link. Uh, Broughton. Here. Chen. Cisneros. Here. De La Cruz. Delenn. Here. Duran. Here. Iglesias. LeBron, Here. Manning, Here. Pertula, Pertula, Seleg, Here. Stallings, Here. and Steinbrecher. Here. And De La Cruz, Here. Uh, Iglesias, Here. Pertula. All right, we're now going into uh, closed pursuant to government code sections 11, uh, well, 11126 through 11126.2 and 11126 subparagraph C, subparagraph 1, and business and professions code 6026.7, sub C, sub 3, uh, and uh, government code 11126 sub C sub 17. Also, government code 11126 sub A sub 1, and government code 11126 sub C sub 1 and 6026.7 sub C sub 3. That'll take us uh, far enough along. So we are now into uh, closed and um,
All right, welcome everyone. This is the uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees of the State Bar of California, uh, the general session. We are in open session. And the first item on the agenda is to welcome any members of the public who would like to speak. I understand that uh, Mr. Coleman uh, would like to be heard. And I also understand that we have a couple of people on the uh, on the uh, telephone. So let's take the roll and then invite Mr. Coleman up. Roger. All right, we have a quorum. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, I know that we have several people who want to speak, one of whom is at least is here. Uh, and we have a couple of people on the telephone. I will take the person who is here uh, first and then the people on the telephone. So Mr. Coleman, come up, identify yourself. Please use the microphone by pushing the, uh, the button down. Uh, <clears throat> before we begin, I just wanted to remind everybody uh, that we are being webcast. So it's important that when you speak, please identify yourself and be sure and use your microphone. Uh, because we have a number of people who want to speak today, I'd like to uh, ask uh, each presenter to uh, uh, limit your comments to three minutes, please. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Thank you for, very much for this opportunity to address the uh, Board of Trustees. My name is Thomas F. Coleman, and I'm the legal director of Spectrum Institute, a nonprofit education and advocacy organization promoting reforms to ensure access to justice for seniors and other people with disabilities who become involved in legal proceedings. I'm particularly concerned about probate conservatorship proceedings. My comments today are addressed to item 701, your strategic plan, and item 113, your legislative priorities. Spectrum Inst Institute requests the Board of Trustees to take two actions this year. One, to support a bill to protect the right to counsel for respondents in conservatorship proceedings. And number two, to make the state bar's complaint system uh, more accessible to people with cognitive disabilities. With respect to the right to counsel bill, this is a bill that we've developed and which is supported by several organizations in California and throughout the country. It would direct the state bar, among other things, it would direct the state bar to create performance standards for attorneys who are appointed to represent seniors and other people with disabilities in probate conservatorship proceedings. Such standards right now do not exist and they are sorely needed. Uh, doing this, creating these performance standards would be consistent with goal 4B of the state bar's strategic plan to improve programmatic approaches to increasing access to justice. And I refer you to a report about this bill that's published on the Spectrum Institute website and which I referred to in a letter uh, that I submitted to the Secretary uh, a couple of days ago. Yes, and she uh, distributed those to all board members and we also have extra copies here. Thank you. Second is on the complaint system accessibility. The public should be informed that anyone who becomes aware of violations of the rules of professional conduct by any attorney may file a complaint with the state bar against the alleged offender. Some people have been told that third party complaints are not allowed. In other words, only the, the client can file the complaint. This information is number one, not correct. And secondly, it's inconsistent with goal 5B, which calls for effective communication about public protection to external audiences. And on that issue, uh, I refer you to a commentary that I published um, that was in the Los Angeles Daily Journal newspaper on November 29, 2019. And as you can imagine, it, accessibility to the complaint system for people with cognitive disabilities is extremely important. Oftentimes, they're not aware that they're being shortchanged by their attorneys or that unethical conduct is occurring. And in, even if they were aware, vaguely, uh, they lack the ability to file complaints on their own. Finally, seniors and other people with disabilities involved in conservatorship proceedings will not have access to justice 
unless they receive representation by competent counsel and unless the state bar takes proactive measures to make the complaint system accessible to them. So uh, we're encouraging the board to take a look at this and I've been in communication with your prior executive director and there's interest in this, but now is a good time to actually start being proactive about it because this is a class of people that either individually or collectively are not able to advocate for themselves or be here or go before the legislature. So they have to rely on people like me as a volunteer to bring this to your attention and then your goodwill to try to make something happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sean? Mr. Coleman? Yes. So uh, I, I'm Sean Seleg, I'm the vice chair. Thank Hi. you for your comments and I appreciate your work on behalf of vulnerable populations. Uh, with regard to the, I took note of your comment that um, some people have been told that third parties can't report a complaint against an attorney and of course you've acknowledged that's not, that's incorrect information. Anyone Correct. can make a complaint to the bar about an attorney, whether that person is a client or not. So if you, um, uh, if you find out the source of that information, and this wouldn't be the right place to do it, but let our staff know because we want to be sure that no one is inadvertently giving out incorrect information from the state bar and if it's, uh, which I'd be surprised is happening, if it's from another source, we'd like to be able to have the opportunity to educate them so they don't discourage third parties from making complaints. Okay, I will follow up with that and, and um, in a, but in addition to that, I mean I've heard this from, from a variety of people but I do have a specific case in mind that I can bring to the attention of your staff but I think that, that if you're able to somehow get the word out, especially to those who attorneys who practice in the probate courts throughout the state, so through whatever, uh, through the state association of attorneys or other vehicles to get the word out that if they observe, because they're right there day in and day out, if they observe that, that they should bring it forward, um, I know it, it's uncomfortable for people to do that about a colleague, um, but you know, if they don't and they see it, then it's not likely to be reported by anybody else. But I'll I'll follow up with your staff okay. about the specific. That's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you for coming. All right. Thank you again. Now I understand we have uh, one or more people on the telephone who would like to um, make public comments. Would uh, the first of you, uh, however you decide that. Uh, please uh, identify yourself by name and the agenda item to which you're addressing your remarks. Thank you. Hi there. This is Tila Chalmers from the Alameda County Bar, and I would like to address item number 703 and specifically the issue of allowing attorneys to list their areas of practice on their state bar profiles with no state bar review of the attorney's claim. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, okay. and uh, yes, please proceed and um, please limit your remarks to about three minutes. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So about 11 years ago, as you know, the state bar proposed a program called Find a Lawyer, uh, which was essentially the same as the current proposal. And at that time, the state bar's mission included advocating for its member attorneys. And so this made sense because the state bar had ascertained people needed help marketing their practices. The discussion was very challenging, and in many ways it was a forerunner to the later developments for the state bar because it really pitted the interests of attorney members against public protection. And in the end, the board decided not to go, go through with it. At this point, though, the State Bar's mission is only public protection and access to justice. Access to justice is a term of art that refers to uh, the problem of people being able to afford legal help. Uh, the chance to be able to search and find an attorney who claims to know family law and will charge you for that help has nothing to do with access to justice. The materials suggest that this is an access issue because people who can afford an attorney have a hard time finding one. That's not really a problem though. Google, Yelp, billboards, it's not hard to, even the yellow pages, not hard to find someone who claims to practice, for example, family law. 
What people really need, though, is the way to find a lawyer who is a good family law attorney. And I, I don't know about you, but my experience is my friends and family are constantly asking me if I know a good family lawyer. And that's what LRSs do. The uh, proposal, on the other hand, does nothing to address that need. And in terms of public protection, it goes a long way to reducing it, actually. I think we all know that we don't tend to read disclaimers or terms and conditions. What people will see is that the state bar, which is an entity that regulates both attorneys and LRSs, tells them that this attorney practices family law. When LRSs put someone on a family law panel, the state bar's own regulations require that we do our due diligence to ensure this attorney has family law experience. It would be poor policy for the state bar to create what the Court of Appeal has indicated is essentially an online LRS, but not subjected to the regulation the state bar imposes on others. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else on the uh, telephone who would like to address the board? Yes, this is Carol Kahn from the Bar Association of San Francisco. Welcome, and go ahead. Please re uh, limit your remarks to about three minutes. Thank you. So I, too, want to follow Tila's excellent lead um, regarding item 703 and the issue of optional practice area reporting by licensed attorneys um, in California. I'm the director of the Lawyer Referral Service here at the Bar Association of San Francisco, have been since 2010. Um, and I first began at the Bar Association answering calls and interviewing potential clients um, as far back as 30 years ago now. Um, I have heard callers ask and say all kinds of things imaginable and unimaginable in my 30 years with the Lawyer Referral Service. And one of them relates to the sometimes confusion that members of the public have with where they have called, asking simply, is this the state bar? And there's a lot of weight that's put in understanding why that question is asked, because the caller, the consumer, is looking for an authority, a bona fide resource, and a trusted resource. And so at the Bar Association of San Francisco, when we get that question, we let the caller know we're certified by the, we're not the state bar, but we're certified by the state bar with rules approved by the Supreme Court that ensure that when you speak to the lawyer that we refer you to, that lawyer has been vetted for their experience in the area of law, they carry insurance, and they're in good standing with the state bar free of, dis of a discipline record. Now, we're also here for any questions and concerns they may have as they journey with the attorney um, along the path of representation. And then we explain that the state bar licenses and disciplines attorneys. That's their function. And we are, in a sense, in essence, their arm for certified, qualified referral. So now with the proposed addition of, of um, attorneys voluntarily being able to obviously um, display their er up areas of practice, whether they have one month of experience or 20 years, um, the public viewer to the website will know exactly where they are and wh what they're looking at. This is the definitive authority on all things attorney statewide. The entity that will protect me the entity that knows the good ones from the bad ones. Um, if the attorney has a public discipline record, I can find it here. And I can call the state bar and complain about my attorney. And I can call the state bar about a fee dispute I have with my attorney. And these are all the various items that are in place to support and protect the public. So the state bar is on the one hand, with its proposition for consumer protection to protect the person in a place when things can go wrong with a lawyer, is now very much in the place under this proposed change to actually promote, if you will, inadvertently, that people step into situations with attorneys who, may, who, who they're told we haven't vetted at all their experience, at the same time saying, we want you to use a certified lawyer referral service because we've actually set out those protections 
but only over here under the lawyer referral program. So I would implore, implore the Board of Trustees to consider carefully how this kind of proposition goes against the very protections and proposition to the public that the State Bar stands for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else on the telephone who would like to address the board? Is there anyone uh, else in the room who would like to address the board? All right, then. We will move on to the minutes uh, seeking approval of the November 14, uh, 2019 open session minutes. I will uh, dispense with the reading of the minutes. May I deem the minutes approved? Hearing no objections, the minutes are approved. <coughs> Next is the chair's report. And I do have a number of uh, uh, topics I'd like to address. First of all, for the members of the public who may not be aware, this is the second day of the uh, meetings of the Board of Trustees uh, this month. Yesterday, we had our annual strategic planning session where we look at uh, issues that we want to include uh, in our uh, strategic plan or modify or supplement. Um, this is a, uh, an initiative that uh, is very much driven by the staff in consultation with members of the board. Uh, I thought that the strategic planning session yesterday was very fruitful. We had uh, a number of very good presentations by both uh, outside consultants or uh, other interested people and uh, by the uh, staff itself. I want to commend everyone on the staff who participated in pre uh, preparing for the strategic uh, session and or who, and or who uh, presented at it, and especially our uh, executive director, Donna Hershkowitz, who led the effort uh, and um, and did a great job, so thank you very much. As many of you know, uh, our former executive director, Leah Wilson, uh, resigned, uh, and I think we were all very sorry to see her go, but um, she had some very happy changes in her personal life and wanted to take the opportunity to pursue them. Uh, while she was here, she was instrumental in the transformation of the bar after deunification. Uh, she had the big picture of where she wanted to see the bar go and how to get there, but at the same time she had an uncanny ability uh, to know all of the details of each part of the uh, uh, moving parts that needed to be accomplished to uh, achieve her goal. I was constantly amazed at how she could know uh, the subject of one meeting in depth with a lot of details and then move on to uh, the next meeting uh, immediately following and uh, on an entirely different subject and then go into those details. Uh, her vision of how the bar could accomplish its public protection mission while also tackling uh, access to justice and, inclu uh, and inclusion and diversity challenges was amazing. Her list of accomplishments is uh, too long to recite, but suffice it to say that we very much appreciated her leadership and will miss her. On the other hand, um, we are extremely lucky that Donna Hershkowitz uh, was here to take over the reins from Leah. Donna has long experience in Sacramento and with the judicial branch uh, and has been serving uh, before her appointment as uh, interim uh, ex uh, executive director uh, as director of programs. Leah strongly recommended uh, Donna and Donna has enthusiastically stepped in and has been a joy to work with uh, in the brief time that she's been here in, the, in this role, like a week. But uh, we look forward to working with her. So Donna, welcome uh, officially, and uh, thank you very much for uh, taking over this important role. Thank you. Uh, on a little bit sadder note, I want to uh, uh, express on behalf of the board our uh, sadness uh, of the passing recently of Jim Fox, a former, uh, uh, at the time, president of the uh, Board of Trustees, uh, also more recently the chair of the uh, Committee on Bar Examiners, but who throughout his uh, long and distinguished career as a district attorney of, I believe, Santa Clara County, is that right? San Mateo. San Mateo County, excuse me, San Mateo County. Um, 
was a leader in the bar uh, and uh, in the judicial uh, arena uh, in general. He was a very uh, forward-looking district attorney and was highly respected throughout the state. Uh, he was a man of impeccable integrity, high intellect, and a man whose wisdom came with a sly sense of uh, Irish humor. In addition, he was very good at uh, bringing pastries that he had uh, hand-baked to the board meetings, and I must say we uh, significantly uh, miss those treats. So uh, he has gone too soon, uh, but um, we know he's going to a good place. Uh, and a, <clears throat> a contribution on, his, on the behalf of the uh, Board of Trustees has been made to his uh, prescribed charity. Uh, also, at the last meeting in, in November, uh, Bridget Grammy, uh, who is a uh, somewhat of a regular here, um, made some recommendations about how to uh, perhaps make our uh, board meetings more user friendly. Uh, and one suggestion was to move the cons uh, the uh, closed sessions to the end of the uh, uh, schedule, and then uh, have the open session first so people weren't waiting around through uh, an unpredictable length of time. We have uh, instituted that, as you'll notice, from the um, uh, agenda today and are looking at a couple of the other uh, suggestions that she made. The last item that I have is uh, the approval of the revised liaison assignments. That uh, basically was uh, raised by Donna. Uh, when she noted that we had uh, significant overlap with uh, liaisons to the Programs Committee, but at the same time liaisons to access to justice and um, inclusion uh, and um, diversity, which largely overlapped a lot of what the Programs uh, Committee was doing anyway. So uh, it's my recommendation that we eliminate the liaisons to the Programs Committee uh, maintaining the liaisons to the uh, access to justice and in, uh, inclusion and diversity um, uh, roles. So uh, that would be my um, recommendation and uh, seek approval from the board. I think do we need a motion. Yeah, okay, so the uh, chair will uh, uh, entertain a motion. Brandon, uh, move and uh, Juan, second. Is there any discussion? May I substitute the role? It's approved. Okay, let's uh, let's see here. Where are we? Okay, consent agenda. We have a number of items on the uh, consent agenda. The ED report. Pardon me. The ED report. Oh, report. Oh, ED report. <coughs> I missed it. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we we wouldn't want to miss the ED report. So let's do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so when I was thinking about what to include in my inaugural written executive director's report to the board, I reviewed the ED reports from the past year and a half or so. And um, to my surprise, I guess, um, in nearly every one, I saw statements like, this is a time of palpable promise. This is an exciting time. We've achieved an important milestone. The state bar is on the precipice of whatever it is we were on the precipice of at that time. <clears throat> so I must admit I, I followed suit, noting in my written report how the annual planning session provides an important opportunity to review the state bar's progress in implementing the objectives that are designed to move us closer to, to meeting our ambitious and important goals. So I guess the cynical amongst us, and I know there are some of us on the board who fit that category, um, would take from all of that that we just like flowery language. Um, but that's not what I take from it. What I take from it is the picture of a state bar that has undergone transformational change in the last few years. A state bar that sets ambitious goals and then actually undertakes the actions necessary to achieve them. A state bar that that strives to be innovative and forward-thinking in carrying out our mission to protect the public, advance the ethical and competent practice of law, and support access to and inclusion in the legal system. A state bar that, is the dedic that has the dedicated, hardworking staff necessary to stand up to the challenge that we as leadership have set for them to carry out these important goals. 
I did want to take this opportunity to personally thank the board for entrusting me with the opportunity and responsibility for leading our staff as the interim ED to continue to push forward on our ambitious agenda, to continue to con conduct groundbreaking studies, and to implement an array of changes that, we can, that ensure that we can stand tall and stay with, say with confidence that we are working every day to protect the public. Generally, um, I don't want to repeat what's in the written report, and in the future I won't. Um, I don't think that's the best use of, of your time. Um, however, this time there is one thing from my written report that I did want to briefly mention, and those are my personal priorities for 2020. Uh, in the report, I lay out uh, as my pr priorities employee engagement, customer service, access to justice, and stewardship of the state bar budget. I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to set as my priorities and how to best capture why I felt it so important to identify these four things as those priority items. And ultimately, I think I put it all out on the table when I, um, when I figured out how to say that in the written report. So if you'll just indulge me for a minute, I'd like to read just some snippets um, from what I wrote regarding each of those priorities. With regard to employee engagement, We've made many strides in the past few years, including implementing a training and development program to give staff opportunities to stretch and develop and demonstrate skills to move up the career ladder, rolling out a telecommuting po policy that allows telecommuting up to two days a week, and providing a focus on more and better training opportunities for staff. But the data from the employee engagement surveys tell us there's still much more to do on this front. Following the analysis of the 2020 survey results, we will update the Employee Engagement Action Plan and make marked steps to implementing those items not yet implemented. With regard to customer service, the State Bar has made excellent strides in improving customer service with the professionalization of our call center, but customer service is something that must permeate all areas of the State Bar. I plan to work with leadership and staff to identify ways we can improve customer service efforts including providing timely and appropriately informative responses across all areas of the bar. Access to justice. We have several important access to justice initiatives in the works and we must see them through and advance them further. We would be remiss if we did not grab the justice gap study by the horns and push forward with what now has come into greater focus. The justice gap study helps us identify areas of great need, both subject matter wise and geographically. It tells us that the justice gap is wide and it is not limited to those who are indigent. The State Bar has the great honor of distributing considerable funds to legal services organizations and we must evaluate how the justice gap study can be used to better inform the allocation of those funds. And on the final priority, stewardship of the State Bar budget, the State Bar received a significant fee increase for 2020. The board and the State Bar leadership are fully cognizant that this increase represents only a portion of the funding actually needed to fully fund the bar. Nonetheless, the State Bar must be exceptional stewards of the licensing fees that we receive and we must do so in a manner that adheres to the purposes for which the 2020 fee increase was granted. As good stewards of the fees, we must delve more deeply into the issue of capital improvements as we will discuss later in more detail. As part of the 2020 fee increase, the bar sought a one-time increase of $134 for capital improvements. We received a $40 increase spread over 10 years. The result is approximately $800,000 per year to spend on capital improvements. At the same time, the request to reestablish a workable reserve was not fully satisfied, with only $3 approved by the legislature. The amount and structure of the funding over a period of years pose a real challenge and with the board, bar leadership must and will dig in to determine the next step forward. Uh, moving on to the final piece of my uh, report to you this <coughs> afternoon. Um, as with all ED reports, since the adoption of our performance metrics, um, the written report uh, attached to the agenda contains an assessment of how the state bar did in meeting its performance metric. This particular report looks at the 13 monthly metrics and performance in the months of October and November. There was only uh, one metric that didn't meet the targets that wasn't already discussed by RAD um, and, or the Finance Committee today, and that um, was a metric, uh, metric ARCR2, uh, the 
target, uh, the goal is that external reporters, external callers report a high level of overall satisfaction with call center, um, with their call center experience. The target is that 75% that of external callers would report a high level of overall satisfaction. For October and November, uh, we came close but did not achieve that target. Uh, we had 73% and 72% overall satisfaction collectively. Staff continues to work to improve the performance on this metric. We've begun to revise the telephone tree scripts consistent with recommendations that we received from a professional consultant, and we're planning on recording all scripts with a more engaging voice to help set the tone and expectations for callers. We anticipate that these changes will result in us meeting and eventually exceeding our target. Uh, the metrics that I will present at the March meeting will be significantly more comprehensive. As I mentioned, these metrics just covered the months of October and November. Uh, in March, we will have the uh, monthly metrics for December and January. We will have the 2019 fourth quarter metrics, and we will have the annual metrics as of the end of 2019. It's my plan that we take the opportunity at the March meeting to fully discuss the metrics and how we are doing as an organization to meet our performance targets. Thank you, Donna. All right, uh, back to the consent uh, agenda. Does anyone have any uh, item on the consent agenda they would like uh, taken off? As Therefore, we will do a deem uh, all of the uh, items on the consent agenda approved. All right. Uh, reports of board committees. On behalf of the uh, board executive committee, this is now um, number 110 on the agenda. Uh, the uh, executive committee uh, at its meeting earlier today uh, move to uh, ask the board to approve and ratify the revised board of trustees policy manual. Uh, it is almost complete. It's the uh, end of a long uh, and winding road to uh, get as far as we have. There is one item that remains open uh, before the uh, policy uh, manual will be complete, but uh, we did uh, uh, authorize a number of, or X number of changes today. So. Uh, that is my uh, report on that. And let's see. <coughs> yeah. Um, is there any objection to uh, approving and ratifying the? Uh, Motion. Okay. Uh, any uh, discussion? Uh, may I substitute the roll? Thank you. It's approved. Uh, Sonia. Actually, we don't need a mo uh, motion or a second for something reported by the committee since I'm moving it by introducing it and because the committee did it, it's a second. But anyway, all right, the second item uh, from the uh, Board of Trustees uh, meeting this morning uh, is approval of the uh, 2020 legislative priorities by, uh, uh, for the Board of, uh, uh, excuse me, for the Executive Committee. Um, by reporting it, I'm moving it. The committee um, has approved it, so that substitutes the second, or that constitutes the second. Uh, is there any discussion or any questions? May I substitute the rule? Okay, that's approved as well. Or moved. Uh, uh, Rad, any uh, report? So, uh, leapfrogging from yesterday's um, strategic planning regarding um, issues in the justice system, uh, Rad is happy to report that we will continue that discussion, continue the uh, the progress I think that we've uh, made in that area <clears throat> and continue to look at ways, <clears throat> excuse me, that the board can continue to increase the public's uh, satisfaction and uh, confidence in the justice system that we 
uh, administer here. So um, for all the uh, board members, uh, July is going to be a fun meeting, so <coughs> hope you uh, uh, make plans to be there. Okay, thank you. Renee, finance. Don't really have anything to add. We approved our work plan and we're good to go. Great. Josh, audit, anything to report? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, we also approved our um, work plan for 2020 and we have begun the um, annual financial audit. Thank you. All right. Let's go into uh, the agenda items. 701, adoption of the uh, revised strategic plan. Donna. So we had quite a, we had quite a full day yesterday and then some, I would say. Um, I know these strategic planning sessions are dense with a lot of information to absorb and a lot of brainstorming to do. Um, but they really do provide us with a great opportunity to plot our course for the year or years to come. Before we walk through the takeaways from yesterday and what, we, what I'm going to recommend for adoption by the board, um, I want to take a moment to raise an issue that I've been struggling with. Um, I must say that I've been perplexed uh, by the frequency with which we amend our strategic plan. Um, I did some quick research and came to that conclusion that the State Bar strategic plan is um, in part strategic plan, in part operational plan, and maybe a little tactical plan thrown in. Um, strategic plans more typically are adopted and remain in force as the high-level architecture for the organization, the lofty goals governing the direction of the organization for the length of the plan, in our case, a five-year plan. Um, strategic plans often describe the organization's mission, how the goals uh, support that mission, and how we measure success toward achieving those goals. They, uh, they contain strategic, not operational objectives. Um, it's the operational plan that sets forth how we will achieve the important strategic goals. I believe it's because of the mixed nature of our plan that we find ourselves amending specific dates um, or specifics of some of the objectives. And I'm not sure that that's frankly the best use of your time. And it also looks like maybe we're moving the, moving the ball on the, strate on the strategic plan by changing dates to look like we are keeping up with what we had originally set. So over the course of the next six months, I plan to work with board leadership to bifurcate our plan into a more typical strategic plan uh, and operational plan and present the revised strategic plan and its implementing tool, the operational plan, um, to, at the board's July meeting. So in the meanwhile, uh, when we discuss amendments to the strategic plan, know that some of the items we are changing or adding may ultimately be moved out of the plan proper and into an operational plan. Um, it's for this reason that you'll see with my recommendations, I'm tending to recommend as board resolutions, directions to staff rather than new or revised strategic plan objectives. So now it's time to recap uh, where we are following yesterday's planning session. We started the day with a session on expanding access through licensing non-attorneys, non triple LTs, and other non-attorneys providing law-related services. Um, I think we all learned a lot from the representatives from the state of Washington, not to mention our uh, presentations from our Office of Professional Competence staff. Um, I think we can learn a lot from what Washington has done, what worked well, and maybe more importantly, what didn't work as well. Um, what was clear from the discussion and the materials presented was that there are a number of thorny issues we need to think through if we will recommend a licensing paraprofessionals in California, um, including paths to entry, um, the types of practice areas, and whether we should limit those areas, at least initially when we launch such a program, uh, what would the boundaries be of the work that they are permitted to do, what would the regulatory structure look like? Would they be required to have liability insurance the way they are in the state of Washington? Um, should the same organization regulate these paraprofessionals as regulates the existing legal document assistance or unlawful detainer assistance? These, two, these questions are too numerous to answer right now, and they were too numerous to answer yesterday. Um, so as a result, um, I'm recommending adoption of uh, the resolution that you see up on the screen. Um, no, not that one. That one. That the Board of Trustees, in consultation with the Access Liaisons, take the following steps 
to form a working group to develop recommendations to the board by the end of 2020 for Triple LT programming in California. Develop a draft charter, identify the appropriate size and composition of the working group, solicit interest and participation in the working group, and return to the board in March 2020 for appointment of the members of the working group. It might be easier, Mr. Chair, if we um, take these one at a time and uh, have action from the board on each of these as we go through. So each proposed resolution? Yep. All right. So uh, why don't you read the first resolution and we'll... Uh... Yep. So uh, resolve that the Board of Trustees direct staff in consultation with the Board's Access Liaisons to take the following steps to form a work working group to develop recommendations to the board by the end of 2020 for a triple LT program in California. And here are the steps. Develop the, a draft charter, identify the appropriate size and composition of the working group, solicit interest and participation in the working group, return to the board in March 2020 for appointment of the members of the working group. Is there any discussion, Josh? Um, uh, Josh Bertula, just very briefly. Um, Donna, develop a draft charter. Uh, at what point is that going to take place? I, I kind of felt like that might have been out of place. Maybe I don't understand what that means. So the it, it may not be your understanding. It may be my grammatical construction. Um, the the what I'm asking, what I'm suggesting that the board adopt is a resol resolution that would have staff work with the access liaisons to to do a series of things to develop a draft charter so that they could then, based on that charter, um, identify what the appropriate composition of, of a working group would be. Representatives from X group, representatives from Y groups, or based on the work that they're doing, for them to identify the appropriate size and to solicit interest in participation in the working group. Having the draft charter will help will help that solicitation so we can inform those that we are soliciting um, what it is we are asking them to do as part of this working group. And then with that draft charter and the um, and the list of potential members for the working group, we would return to the board, in, ideally in March, uh, if we can move that quickly, um, to ask for the appointment of the members of that working group. Uh, um, I'm sure other people understand it a little better than me. It, it, isn't that a cart before the horse? It, it, wouldn't, wouldn't you have the working group come up with the charter? I guess that's where I'm trying to just figure out uh, so, uh, no, not necessarily. Um, this is certainly to use as one example what we did with uh, um, Access Through Innovation of Legal Services. We developed the charter um, and, then, uh, and then solicited the members of the working group with, based on the charter that we had. Okay. Ruben? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and my question actually may be the second part of Josh's, and that is um, when, Donna, when you're referring to we, uh, I take it to understand we're talking about staff in conjunction with the access liaisons. Exactly. That, that is the, the, the group of people, so four or five, three or four of you, to whom any of us um, go if we have a recommendation, for example, on a potential member or a contour of the charter. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Renee. Um, I guess maybe re sort of related uh, to Josh's. Uh, comment did we decide that it was I know I argued for limiting the scope but should we say specifically triple LT or I mean, it seems like we've kind of made a decision that that's what it should be as opposed to some of the other tangential options so I you know I struggled with the with the wording here because I wasn't sure where we ultimately walked away at the end of the day we could say paraprofessional um, and then if the recommendations, ultimately ultimately this group can determine if the recommendation is a triple LT program, a legal advocate program, uh, or sort of any other option, we can certainly look, call, it, call it that to give that, the working group, the option to determine what structure m might make more sense. Yeah, I, and I, I would feel better about that. But if it was triple L, you could say, you know, for example, triple LT or mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments on the first proposed resolution? Um, where it says triple LT, mm -hmm. change that to paraprofessional, 
and then you can put a, a parenthetical that says, for example, triple LT. Chair will entertain a motion. Second. Ruben moves. Uh, Brandon uh, seconds. Any further discussion? May I substitute the rule. Motion uh, or resolution passes. Uh, so turning to the second panel of yesterday's planning session, ensuring a fair and effective discipline system. Um, I heard from many board members last night after the panel about how intrigued you were um, by the out of the box thinking that Professor Chris Robertson brought to the table in discussing how we might think about addressing some of the findings of the Farkas report that point to at least some disparate treatment in the state, state bar's discipline system. Um, we, certainly don't, we certainly don't have enough information right now to select which of Professor Robertson's 10 suggestions we could or should move forward on, nor do we know if we gave Professor Robertson or others who work in this space even one more day to visit with OCTC and learn what we do, how many more recommendations he might come up with. So as a result, um, uh, I, uh, I constructed the following resolution, that the Board of Trustees direct staff to engage with professionals to develop a plan to address the findings from the Farkas report. Staff shall report back to the Board in July 2020 for consideration of the plan and adoption of next steps. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Juan. Brandon. Uh, motion by Brandon, second by Sonia. Is there any further discussion? May I substitute the roll? Resolution passes. Great. Following Professor Robertson, we explored the, the procedural fairness surveys and what they might tell us about how fairly complaining <coughs> witnesses and attorneys feel they've been treated in the process. Um, as a result of that discussion, I am making a recommendation that we amend uh, the strategic plan, um, uh, specifically uh, goal two, objective B, um, and uh, it, would, it would now read, um, develop and Im implement transparent and accurate reporting tracking of the health and efficacy of the discipline system, and here I've added, and measures to improve the fairness and efficacy of the discipline system to include um, A, an updated workload study for OCTC, and this is as a result of the recommendations of the state auditor, um, B, identification of staffing and resource needs based on the results of that study, and C, um, uh, C deleting what, what we currently had, um, evaluating the different points of contact between the state bar and complaining witnesses and respondents, to identify areas where modifications to the form or content of communications could improve the sense of procedural fairness, and D, pilot changes in the form or content of communications with complaining witnesses and respondents to identify measures that will improve the sense of procedural fairness by complaining witnesses or respondent attorneys. I'll give everybody a minute or two to read that and digest it. All right, is there any discussion, questions? Yes, Brandon. 
I'll tell you what, Brandon, hold off a minute. We still have some folks who are digesting and reading the uh, stuff here. All set? Okay. All right, Brandon, then go ahead, please. I guess my question was to the terms, uh, the fairness and efficacy of the discipline system. So fairness and efficacy, have we defined those in, um, in other places in our strategic goal? Is this something that we're adopting um, as far as a baseline? I think just whenever we talk about those um, those two different things, a lot of people will derive different meanings from fairness and, and uh, efficacy. So um, I just want to make sure that we're not establishing some sort of baseline without um, fully vetting that, what, what that baseline should be. So we do use the word efficacy uh, uh, immediately before in the existing plan where we talk about implement, developing and implementing transparent and accurate reporting reporting and tracking of the health and efficacy of the system. Um, so we've, uh, uh, so that's in the existing part of the plan, and so what we've added is, and, and measures to improve the fairness and efficacy of the system. Um, fairness is not defined uh, in the strategic plan, um, and um, right, the point here was, we were looking at these pre procedural fairness surveys that we are, that we are doing to um, to improve the sense of fairness of the of the system, um, to make sure that individuals feel like they've been heard, feel like they've had the opportunity to present all of the evidence that they have um, for the consideration of the complaint in their discipline system. Um, so, because we were uh, focusing on the um, the procedural fairness surveys, and um, that's where I lifted the word from. But you're absolutely right; it's not otherwise defined in the plan. So, would it be safe to say then that we're talking about the procedural? Uh, a procedural sense as opposed to an outcome sense? Yes. Okay. All right, I would uh, move the resolution then. Warren? Do you have a question? Were you seconding or? Second. Second, okay. I have a, a motion by Brandon, uh, second by Juan. Is there any further discussion? Right. May I substitute the rule? And then finally, at the planning session, we turned our attention to recidivism and restitution. Um, we agreed to come back in March to adopt a recidivism metric after we take more time to absorb the statistics that we were presented with. Um, and uh, we agreed that staff should develop, or you agreed that staff should develop an action plan for consideration by the board of steps to improve the likelihood victims of attorney misconduct will be able to collect on or otherwise uh, to improve the likelihood victims of attorney misconduct will be able to collect on or otherwise receive court-ordered restitution from disciplined attorneys. Um, so that resolution is that staff is directed to develop an action plan to improve the, the ability of victims of attorney misconduct to collect on or otherwise, it should say receive, not received, the court ordered restitution from disciplined attorneys. Brandon, you have your mic. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> or discussion. Yes, Brandon. Thank you. Um, I think this is a really good chance to continue to highlight the good that the bar does uh, for victims of attorney misconduct and how attorneys will uh, pay a portion of their bar dues to into this fund. Um, and I think it is um, significant that the bar continue to uh, increase the efficacy of collecting um, on these judgments. And I think the bar is, the staff is taking uh, excellent steps to ensure that. And from a legislative um, policy standpoint, I'm really glad that, that we're making that one of our uh, uh, primary objectives this year. And I hope that uh, those in the legislature here uh, that uh, we have a strong message that we're um, trying to protect those who are most vulnerable here in California and uh, make sure that they get put back in, into a position they were in prior to the misconduct occurring. So I think this is a great thing, fully support it, and I'm happy to move the resolution. All right, a motion by Brandon. Second by Ruben. Is there any further discussion? 
May I substitute the roll? Motion passes. And the final resolution that you see on the screen is uh, the one that is described in the written agenda item itself. Um, and it's a recommendation to modify goal two, objective N, which relates to the submission uh, to the board of the report on the California attorney practice analysis. Um, the uh, language of the objective currently says uh, that we would um, provide the report by December 31st of 2019. Um, we uh, chose to delay submission of the report uh, because we are awaiting the submission of um, NCBE's job analysis, the National Conference of Bar Examiners, so we can take their findings into consideration in developing the recommendations from our job analysis study. If you asked me at 9 a.m. today, I would have said that we're expecting the NCBE report um, mid to late January. We're kind of already in late. Um, uh, but I learned this morning that it's now looking, looking like mid-February um, when the, the NCBE's analysis will um, be done. But we, the, um, the working group, the uh, CAPA working group, thought it was important, um, as did the Supreme Court, that we take the opportunity to review what NCBE's analysis and recommendations <coughs> are and take those into consideration in the final report that we present to the board. Um, so what I am recommending is that we just take the, we remove the date um, from the from objective N of goal two about when the CAPA study will be submitted. Any questions or discussion? I'll move the resolution. Second. Thank you. Uh, motion by Brandon, second by Jose. Jose. Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion? May I substitute the roll? Motion passes. takes care of item 701. 702, John and Steed, welcome. This is approval of the State Bar Final 2020 budget pursuant to Business and Professions Code 6140.1. And I believe John Adams is going to lead the discussion. So I think I have a PowerPoint, which I know our board secretary will get up. All right, I will, good afternoon everyone. I will, as always, try to make this as riveting as possible. So uh, this is for the adoption by the, uh, by the board uh, for the 2020 uh, State Bar budget. And so this is item uh, 702. So my presentation is going to be very similar uh, to what I did to the Finance Committee um, in um, late December. I'm going to provide um, with one minor change from what I provided to the Finance Committee. But this is the overview. I'm going to provide just a brief highlight of the fee bill and the increase. I, um, Executive Director, our interim, mentioned that um, we did get a historic increase on that. So I want to talk a little about the impacts on, on the budget. And then just do a comparison of what the state bar needs were as part of the analysis we did in 2018, um, ultimately had made the request and what the fee bill actually did approve. Um, I'm going to talk about a few highlights on the budget, really just some general themes, um, really focus on three things, um, and then talk about some challenges that we have going forward. Um, of course, I'll get into some numbers, um, both bar-wide and, and general fund-wide. Um, talk a little about technology, capital projects, and tenant improvements, um, with the focus really on the capital and being able to finance or fund those projects going forward and to do tenant improvements for the San Francisco building. So with that, um, just on the fee, uh, the fee bill and, and the fee increase, and talking about the first time in over 20 years that the base fee has been increased. And this is um, historic um, in that aspect. Um, certainly thank the legislature and the governor for approving that fee bill and just really the impacts that that has on the state bar um, continuing to fulfill our core mission um, related to protecting the public. Um, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, but certainly we identified other needs 
but to have an increase that hasn't occurred in 20 years and the significance of the increase. I mean, when you look at the numbers, the overall was 30% on the base fee, um, overall 25% impact of the general fund. Um, as um, Trustee Stallins mentioned, the client security fund was actually doubled from 40 to $80 to pay um, victims, which is significant when we look at the payouts, and I'll talk a little more about that. Um, lawyer assistance program, um, because of the reserves and based on recommendations of the state auditor, there's actually a fee holiday. Um, that $1 is just continuing to pay for the voluntary portion of LAP that's outside of the state bar. Um, and then I highlight the funding for technology, capital, and the reserve assessment. And as mentioned earlier by Donna, our request was for larger amounts for that, and, and I'll get into the details on that as well. So here's the just the simple comparison. I'll just go through each one. Um, certainly, we had requested a $100 overall increase on the general fund from an operation side. Really, the, the big one was the increase in staffing in OCTC um, based on the increased workload, um, based on a workload study that was done in 2017 that identified a need for approximately 58 positions. Um, ultimately, what was approved, um, recommended by the state auditor, and then approved was um, a, a funding of 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 a partial funding of one team. That 58 was three teams. They funded one team. And then, uh, you know, the other items there, the fair and equitable retiree health um, was fully funded. Um, the negotiated cost of living increase was funded. Um, we had a higher number for our deficit, um, and there were adjustments on that down to $21. And one of the things that they broke out, which we had actually as one-time assessment that they actually brought out and put it in the act or the um, operating was the seven dollars for ongoing IT infrastructure replacement. So that's really the summary: the seventy-one versus a hundred. Again, very significant um, and has a, a significant impact on the organization. Without that fee increase, this would be a very different presentation to you today. Um, client security, we mentioned it earlier, our request was 80 and that was to pay for the complete backlog at the point in which we did the analysis. That would have, if a full 80 in addition to the current 40 was given, um, we would be able to ultimately pay all the outstanding claims that are within the current fund. But um, the fee bill actually um, is 40 this year and potentially 40 next year um, to, to do that backlog. I mentioned the lawyer assistance program as far as the fee holiday. And then just these are the three areas that our requests were one time to really deal with the, either the backlog and capital or to fund projects, um, especially like IT and, and our uh, license, man license information management system um, to do those funding um, prior to the starting of the project. Um, for technology, it was phased in over five years, um, $5 a year, $1 million, um, $5 to the fee, $1 million a year. Capital was a little bit of a challenge. Um, 134 was our need for our five-year capital plan. Um, ultimately, um, it was $4 a year phased in over 10 years and $40. And so that will be one of the challenges going forward. And then just reserves. So here are my highlights. Um, resources are allocated towards the core mission, right? Discipline, protecting the public. Um, and um, plenty of uh, uh, funding was provided for strategic plan objectives, several that I mentioned in the staff report. Um, and so that's one point. The other point is, again, the historic fee increase. Um, again, very thankful for that increase. Um, and then um, one of the things I will talk about and show you some graphs on is just the significant increase in legal services funding. I know Helen Hong talked about this yesterday. This is historic this, this year and the amount of money that is going to be given um, to provide um, support for legal services throughout the state is very significant. Um, challenges, this is not, um, the fee bill was not a multi-year um, approval, and that was one of our requests was to get multi-year so that we had certainty in our funding um, and also to fund what we anticipate are increases in just general operating costs going forward. Um, again, did not fully fund our identified needs. The five-year capital plan was funded over 10 years, and then IT needs are funded over five years, which really when you talk about the license information management system, which is 
a two and a half to three million dollar project that really covers the next two years um, is going to have to be funded over five years. So this is the summary, and I'll keep it as high level as possible just to do some basic comparisons what the 2019 budget was, 168 million in revenue, um, 214 million um, is this year. Mainly the two main drivers on that is revenue from interest on trust accounts and then of course the fee increase. Um, expenses, um, you will see significant legal services um, grants being made in 2020 based on built up reserves and the additional funding. Also um, from an operation sign personnel cost um, related to the three items that I'll cover in a few minutes. Um, 20 positions are being added um, in this budget in comparison to last year's budget within the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, that, which is that one team um, that is funded. Um, the one area that um, certainly will need to be addressed um, either in 2021 or 2022 and start working on it now is the um, operating deficit in the admissions fund. Um, as costs um, rise, um, certainly the amount of test takers and the amount of the fee hasn't necessarily increased. And so there has been uh, this delta, um, which is a little over 10%. And then significant spend down. Um, the one change that was done between the finance committee um, meeting and this board meeting was a change in legal services grants um, initially, um, which was an error on our side. Um, legal services actually had a surplus of 16 million. It's gone the other way where they're spending down um, over $11 million in additional um, legal services grants. So um, spend downs in all of the restricted funds, bank settlement, um, as you know, um, has between a nine and a $12 million spend down each year. Next year will be the last year of that spend down. Um, and I just go through the other one. Legal services is the other large one that you'll see um, once I get to that um, slide. Just quickly, these are the 11 funds that are um, have activity in 2020. Of course, the general fund, which is really the core fund for the board, um, really covers discipline, which is both OCTC, courts, and probation. Um, and then all support functions, including finance, HRIT, all those others. Um, special revenue fund, which is admissions. This is where you actually have some discretion related to raising fees um, based on covering costs. And then restricted funds. Each of those revenues and each of those funds have specific requirements related to what are eligible as far as expenses. So bar wide, um, I just focus on the, the, book, the bookends. Um, the mandatory fees, um, certainly a significant increase. You see that green bar jump up over $20 million. Um, when compared to uh, 2019 and 2018. And then on the other side, um, other revenues, um, those growths have been specifically in um, interest on the trust accounts. Um, if you remember where um, certainly interest rates were in 2017, 2018, and then the increases, those have, um, you know, as far as budgeted, um, certainly Fed funds rate has decreased um, a few um, times this year. But we've done other things where other banks who weren't paying um, what we call the ECR have increased their payments, at least as far as what interest rate they're paying. Um, we've had major banks that were paying 25 basis points have increased it up to 100 basis points. So that really shows you the additional revenue that's been in, um, generated from uh, the IOLTA stuff. So expenses, um, again, really S and B. Um, a little over 10 million, that is for three major things which I'll cover in the general fund, really the cost of living adjustment, the retiree health care, um, and then the additional positions in OCTC. Um, the other one is legal services grants. Um, just to show you historically, um, in 2018, 50 million was budgeted. Um, this year we have almost $100 million budgeted in legal services grants. That's between both the legal services trust fund and um, bank settlement as, as well. So, so summary, just budget um, 2020 to 2019. Um, I should look this way. Um, we'll talk a little more um, in depth on the general fund. Um, I talked a little about admissions on the 2.5, and then you see the spend down both in bank settlement and legal services. Um, just looking at legal services trust fund in 2020, 
um, budget, 57, over $57 million um, in expenses, equal access, which is some state funding grants, that's 32, and then bank settlement at um, almost $12 million. Um, overall, and, and this is where um, I had a discussion with a board member on the overall budget and surplus, and the number that was provided to the Finance Committee was about $3 million, and it was because of the Legal Services Trust Fund was $16 million the other way, which was $27 million. That's where that it went from 3 to 30 But when I'm looking at this, it's the general fund I want to focus on um, and then also admissions, other areas in which we have developed um, operations um, that are specifically funded by either fees, um, either the licensing fee or the admissions. Everything else is restricted, um, and in some of these cases are planned spend downs. And I'll talk about the reserves for each of these funds as well. Um, so here is the ending reserves for each fund. And, and one of the things I do to the far right is just to show you the reserve level if it's required to be between the 17 and 30 percent. Remember our floor, at least the target, is 17 percent. And if it's above 30, then we need to develop plans for a spend down. So general fund, um, I briefly shaded that. It's 15.7 based on the proposed budget. And we'll talk a little more about that. Admissions, even with the $2.5 million um, operating deficit, and that, operation, that deficit also includes some one-time expenses related to AIMS, um, but that still has a reserve level of over 23%. Client security, elimination of bias are right around that 17 18%. We stroll down to legal uh, le lawyers assistance program, 62%, and that's partly why there was a fee holiday this year is because if you really look at that one closely, the revenues are about $292,000. Um, that is the $1 um, and some interest and some other items, but the expenses of two point one, dollars and that's really the fee holiday. And, and the thought process, at least on that recommendation, was as we're increasing fees other places, if there's not a need to have an active mandatory fee for lawyer's assistance program, we might as well give a, a fee holiday. Um, based on certainly the reserves, that fee holiday can't continue into next year, um, being at 1.5 million, um, but certainly there could be some reduction of it um, for next year. Um, John, can I ask a question? Yes, I, and I should say, if, as I go through these, a lot of numbers, I'm going relatively fast. If you have questions, please ask. Great, so, um, so first is a, a comment for our newer board members, because I remember how uh, it took a while to get up to speed on these. Yes. Um, John mentioned the admissions fund. That's a self-funding uh, fund, so the, the uh, fees that are charged to applicants have to equal the expenditures. Um, so that's why it's a separate line item. The bank settlement is a set of funds we got through a big case that was brought against banks, and we were the benef the bar was the beneficiary yes. of a large settlement fund that is distributed for the purposes of um, legal services funding. Um, so that's background. And then my question, my main question, John, is the client security fund shows a reserve level of 18.2%, which doesn't seem to really match the numbers. And I yeah. also remember we, yes. maybe it's because we reduced the reserve level so we could pay out, uh, honor more claims more quickly. Yeah, there was, um, so the board actually changed the policy, I think it was maybe right before I got here. There was this 18% based on the annual spend. But the concern was is the reserves was based also on the payouts. And so what the board said was is that the, the reserve requirement needs to be on the operating costs, not the payouts. And as you know, there's about eight million. If you just use a number, and I use the number when I talk about fees, about 200000 And so every dollar of an active license fee is $200,000. So um, for, you know, $40 is $8 million. Um, Eighty dollars is one uh, sixteen million. So that reserve requirement is based on the operating costs, not the payouts. If that makes sense. So the payouts are six and a half, six point seven million. So that reserve requirement is really related to the one one three in operating costs. That makes total sense, and I've forgotten that detail. It might make sense to have a footnote maybe on future things because the methodology for that reserve is different than all the other ones now. And, it's yeah. a, and thank you. I, I agree, um, and even in the report. And so, and sometimes I take for granted that everyone at the table is uh, at least as knowledgeable as I am. So, 
Um, that's impossible. But. I, well, <laughs> I've only been here a year. So. And then since we're, since I'm asking about these figures that are right in front of us, um, Donna, I know we, we have our eye on the operating deficit in admissions, but I see the reserve levels down to 23% this year. Oh, um, is that something we can talk about at this meeting, what the plan is for that, or is it going to be on a future meeting agenda to resolve that deficit? Um, the admissions fund. Right. So, um, so actually, they're they're operating with a 23% re uh, percent uh, projected reserve. So within the 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 appropriate. No, I know, but they're burning it down. So yes, just looking a few years ahead. Yes. So certainly, below that level. It certainly it is something that we are going to need to look at going forward. Um, we uh, increased the uh, fees for uh, applicants a few years ago. Um, and it's something that we've been very reluctant to do um, going forward. And but at, at some point we're, we're go we are going to need to look at the burn rate and see how long we can continue. Um, we have been uh, making every effort to see what we can cut in the way of expenditures um, in admissions. But for example, one of the things that we've been talking about uh, doing is uh, piloting. Um, remote proctoring. Um, ultimately, that may end up costing more money, frankly. It may be a, absolutely a better way to proctor our exams, but it may increase the burn rate. And so, yeah, ultimately, we are going to need to spend some time going through the budget and figuring out, um, you know, we think we've probably cut as close to the bone as we can at this point, um, but we need to figure out if there are more w places to cut and uh, what the burn rate is so when we would have a plan for uh, potentially having to look at increased fees. Yeah. You know, just to add on, I, I think the admission staff I is extremely um, knowledgeable of, of the deficit and stuff, and not just last year, but this year, even after putting together the budget and us putting together forecasts, they went back and, and made reductions where they thought, because their goal, it, knowing that at least last year and this year they couldn't get down to a balance, they certainly went back through and made additional reductions to reduce at least the proposed operating deficit. Um, so they're they're trying their best. They're, they've spent a lot of time on identifying areas to reduce costs. And yeah, no question there. Yeah, I realize yeah. there are some external factors that have yeah. led to this, but um, but I mean, it looks to me like we have a year or two before we start getting I, uh, admit, at most before we get below our reserve level. Yeah, and we should start. I mean, I we've talked about doing our planning this summer on on that before we get into next year's budget cycle. Okay, that yeah. sounds good. And Thank just you. as background, there are, there are a couple of things that contributed to um, that contributed to the position that they're in. One is with the separation of the sections, um, we had a larger administrative overhead that had to be allocated to uh, across the board, and admissions took an additional one was it one point six million dollars. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, of, it was before I was here. But. Of uh, administrative overhead um, as a result of the separation of the sections. Then we have things like um, uh, the 3.5% uh, cost, yeah. cost of living adjustment that was given to all staff. That was funded um, for, out of, for general fund staff. Um, but admission staff also obviously were, are entitled to and received the increase. The admissions fund did not have a, a, a similar increase. So uh, any kind of increases like that have that same effect on uh, particularly um, admissions. Um, they're really the, one, the ones who are sort of most affected by that um, outside of the general fund yes. uh, funded offices. Renee. Uh, just on that subject, um, Sean, it's actually not a couple of years. It's not even mm. one year. So uh, I, <laughs> well, there's, cert there's not really anything in there that's going to change significantly. So well, I, I'm well, sure I people are looking at it. I think we should be careful when we say, you know, yeah, eventually we'll look at it or something like that because that number is a problem and maybe we'll come to the conclusion that we can't do anything about it and we have to subsidize it from the general fund, but then we need to be clear on that. Yes, and, and I, one, this is something we have to address before next year's budget. With that said, the 2.5 does include two, at least two items I can think of right off the top of my head that are one time. Um, one is admissions, the AIM system, the 725, and plus there's some, the proctoring stuff, which was a little over a quarter of a million dollars. So there's no question this is 
going into next budget cycle, uh, we need to review and, and decide how to handle it, including potentially increasing the fee or making other reductions. So um, with that, um, I won't go into any other, um, how about if I move on to the next slide? But John, I was yes, just wondering what? why um, with the specialization, the reserves are so high. Um, well, <laughs> the simple response is revenues are exceeding ex um, expenses, <laughs> um, which I, I, you know, I, yeah, and I, I don't have a full grasp on legal spec, and I, I maybe defer to Donna a little on it. Um, you know, this is this. If you look at it, the operating surplus for the year um, isn't. I mean, it's you know, a little over twelve percent, maybe fifteen percent, but it has built over reserves over a long period of time. And I think, um, if you recall, I think it was last year, two years ago, um, legal spec, because it had the reserves, allowed admissions to borrow some money to do the Ames project as its share, and, and it had its own cost. Um, so that was one way to spend down the reserves. The, the, the board reserve policy talks about the 30% coming up with a plan. If it's above 30, to how are you going to, spend it down because there's I think we can all agree there's not a, a reason to even have um, 190 percent reserve is is not necessarily um, needed um, the fees haven't changed um, just the costs haven't um, been there and maybe there needs to be a broader discussion on that so all right sorry and I think you know I Going back and talking about this year, so it's admissions, certainly on uh, legal assist, uh, lawyer assistance program of how the fee is changed for next year because even though we have 62% and the goal should be between 17 and 30%, certainly we can't aff the, the fund can't afford another complete fee holiday. So there has to be some balance there. And then um, going to legal spec, as, as Mark brought up, um, we need to dive into that and, and come up with a spending plan to spend down that money or to provide some sort of fee holiday f um, within that program as well. All right, moving on. So um, certainly talked about uh, just some of the, the funds that had large increase or had f um, reserves. Um, this is the ones that we actually are doing spend downs. And so I try to just talk about the purpose. I sort of highlighted this in the report. Um, the general fund, um, the use of reserves is really uh, meant for the one-time use um, for technology, which was not funded as part of the fee bill. Um, that number is about 1.7 million. Um, admissions um, operating that, that deficit, um, that use of reserves is um, being created mainly because of operations, but also one time. Bank settlement, this is planned spend down. So as, as Sean had mentioned, I believe the number we got back in 2014, 15 was about 50 million. And there's a five year spend down on that. So um, that's why that number is 11.7. Um, there is no revenue other than interest earnings within that fund. So um, client security, very small. Um, you know, operating deficit, um, elimination of bias. This number was a little high, this uh, this fund, and it, the fund's not that large, so it was out over the 30%, so that's why there's a deficit to try to bring it closer to the 17%. Equal access, spend down of grants, uh, justice gap. Um, justice gap money comes in. Um, there's a million dollar transfer from um, justice gap to, I think, equal access at a million dollars. So. Um, that is just um, the difference between costs and, and the revenue. Um, lawyer assistance, that is specifically because of the fee holiday and then ledge activity, um, which has a small spend down. Legal services went from 16 plus to 11.2 million spend down. So this is just the board reserve policy. Um, really talks about when it's appropriate to use reserves um, for those that have a reserve target. Um, you either one-time uses, unexpected expenditure requirements, or multi-year forecast. Um, anything under 10% would require an affirmative uh, vote by the Board of Trustees. Um, the only one that's under um, that forecast, at least the 17% target, is the general fund. 
Um, just quickly on staffing, overall increase of 25. Um, I highlight uh, chief trial counsel, 20 positions, um, a lot of movement. Um, the organization, um, relatively flexible. You'll see a reduction in mission advancement and accountability. This was because there, there's a project management office within that that actually moved over to IT, and that's why you see IT increase uh, five positions. Um, Human Resources had an increase, special projects, um, State Bar Court actually had an increase of two positions. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the general fund um, budget for this year. Um, again, significant increase, um, again, 25% um, increase in, in general fund revenues based on the licensing fee at 17 million. Um, of course, that's all planned to be spent in different areas. We talk about technology 2.4 when you add both operating and the one time. Um, the unfunded, which is the CMS, which we'll talk a little about, um, is coming from reserves. Capital plan um, for our, and, I'll sh and Steve will go over this. Um, initially, the, the capital plan for 2020 was about $5 million, um, but only 800000 in funding, and so that plan has been reduced to one project, about 725000 And then we just talk about the um, costs within salary and benefits, and those are really the, the three areas in which you can see the, the personnel costs have increased. And this is the summary. Um, 2019, and just focus the board, um, without, you know, without making any layoffs or making any changes, um, we had an overall deficit of over $9 million. Um, initially, the budget was proposed at a lot higher funding capital that was reduced significantly. Um, I think the number before was closer to 14 is what was presented to the board last January. Board made adjustments down to the $9 million. Um, the 2020 budget, when you take in even the one-time cost, uh, 1.5 million um, change, at least that's the total deficit. Um, I'm showing projected beginning reserves, and I talk a little about in the staff report about where we project reserves going in, um, because uh, for 2019, even though we had a $9 million budget deficit, um, that deficit is is not gonna be a full $9 million. It's probably gonna be between five and six million as we close the books. Um, again, 15.7% is that number in the right-hand corner. You see the changes. Um, personnel, that 9.7 is mainly those three items. Um, we did have cost increase in other things like retirement and health care. Um, but I, I, as I highlighted, the other three, those were over $7.5 million. And then you see the capital. Last year, $3 million was what was funded, um, only 700000 this year. This is just a general fund summary, um, really just the same thing, just more, um, maybe a little more streamlined. Um, I would just simply focus that um, currently um, you, we adopted a budget last year that ultimately, based on where we ended last year, um, the reserve target, if we had spent the full $9 million, would be above the 17%. Um, the fact that you can see that the ending reserves, at least for the budget at 13.9 or $14 million, Actually, we're projecting uh, beginning reserves to be closer to 16.8 million um, based on us not spending the full budget. Um, so just the target, um, a little off the target when you include the one-time uh, technology project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to sort of cover the technology projects and capital budget. Okay. So the 2020 fee bill uh, funded our technology plan for a total of about $12 million over five years, or $2.4 uh, million per year. Based on a recommendation from the uh, Legislative Analyst Office in their report, that was actually divided up into two different categories. Uh, one was ongoing or cyclical uh, activities, such as hardware replacements, funded at $1.4 million a year, or $7 million total. And the other was special or one-time uh, projects, such as the uh, new Oracle system and the eventual new licensee system, uh, funded at a million dollars per year, or about $5 million uh, overall. Although our original five-year plan does not divide up equally into five uh, equal installments in the way the funding has been provided, for 2020, we have been able to adjust the plan in order to basically live within uh, the, our funding means for this year. Looking ahead to 2021 and beyond, that will be more of a challenge as the new licensee system uh, will cost more than the individual annual uh, funding amounts uh, at the schedule that has been uh, provided. So all of the funded projects are already in uh, 
John's budget under operating uh, costs. We do have one IT project uh, that was not in the five-year plan and had, did not receive separate funding uh, for which reserves would need to be uh, used if they are approved by the board. Um, that is the Odyssey case management system. That is the system used by, as you know, for by OCTC, uh, the courts, and probation. Having used that system for uh, over a year, some inefficiencies and technology uh, challenges have been discovered with the system. There is a long list of enhancements uh, that have been um, come up with by our team of experts. Those are more fully described in a little bit more detail in the budget item memo. The cost of those enhancements is uh, about $1.7 million, uh, which will be done over the course of 2020 and 2021. Our CMS project manager is in the room today if there are any specific questions about CMS. So before I move on to uh, talk about uh, building and capital related stuff, is there are any questions about the uh, technology portion of the budget? Okay, going to move on. Um, for capital, we're going to talk about uh, the capital improvements, uh, potentially a leasing space and tenant improvements, and the use of a state bar uh, space, so those three categories. First, um, addressing uh, capital. Uh, the five-year capital plan is $8.7 million. Um, it was originally heavily front-loaded for 2020 due to prior years of uh, deferred maintenance. As John mentioned, the original plan, as you can see here, was about $5.4 million for this year. Uh, what we are proposing uh, for this year is to just budget for the, uh, for the funded amount to get started on one project. That would be the elevator project. In the meantime, uh, we have uh, transitioned, as uh, some of you know, to Cushman and Wakefield as our new firm for leasing services, property management, and uh, construction project management. They have reviewed the entire five-year plan that was previously um, prepared by CBRE, and they have also engaged a third-party engineering firm for an independent peer review of that plan, uh, and they are also engaging a third-party cost-estimating firm for updated uh, pricing on all of those uh, projects. The purpose of this review generally is to validate or update the scope, the sequence, and the cost estimates for the original uh, five-year capital plan, and in particular to reevaluate that entire plan in light of the projected funding schedule that is available uh, to the bar. So the third party engineering assessment should be wrap is wrapping up uh, this week. The cost estimating part uh, will be starting uh, immediately thereafter. So our recommendation for now is to wait for the results of that review uh, in the budget right now is just the funded amount that we have to get started on one project and we may come back to the board once we have a, a clear idea of how our project should be updated. We may come back uh, mid-year um, with a, uh, a revised capital plan. Questions about capital? Okay. okay. Uh, moving ahead um, to uh, tenant improvements and leasing, we do have one remaining vacant floor in the 180 Howard Street building. That's the third floor. You may recall we did have a deal with an existing building tenant to expand into that space, and that tenant at the time had agreed to finance the warm shell renovation and the tenant improvement in exchange for an ongoing rent uh, credit. Unfortunately, that deal fell through due to internal issues with that um, tenant uh, changes to their internal uh, strategy. So uh, Cushman and Wakefield is marketing the space right now. There are different marketing uh, scenarios. The first and most um, preferable is the same kind of deal that, we'll that we were pursuing, uh, which would be to have a tenant fund the warm shell and the TI. There is actually a, uh, a prospective tenant touring the space uh, in about an hour, uh, so we'll see if anything comes of that. Obviously, other uh, leasing scenarios that are more likely to attract a tenant would be bar funding the warm shell and the tenant uh, potentially funding the TI portion in exchange for a rent credit or, of course, the bar financing uh, all of it. But those are not uh, options at uh, the moment. Reserve spending is not currently contemplated for uh, floor three warm shell or TI work. So if a tenant cannot be found who will do this deal in the way that uh, I have um, just uh, described, we will simply recommend deferring any further action on floor three until we figure out other um, 
other financing uh, solutions or other building solutions, which we will be talking about when we get to uh, next steps um, related to our overall real estate strategy. Uh, we'll point out the bar does have, uh, as you know, some outstanding real estate loans. We have started um, discussions uh, with some banks to consider the possibility of additional loans as one uh, possible means of financing uh, those warm shell and tenant improvement uh, renovations. And uh, finally, looking at the, the space that the state bar itself occupies, um, we have engaged uh, Cushman and Wakefield's Workplace Strategies Group to do a uh, space uh, assessment for us. They have been reviewing our, util our the amount of space that we have, how we utilize that space. The goal would be um, a plan that would allow the bar to give up at a minimum one office floor, potentially two, and to give up some service space that it has on the ground floor uh, to make all of this space available for addition tenant leasing for all office and uh, retail tenants. We expect to have that report uh, by the end of the month, cost estimates for um, work that would need to be done in order to facilitate giving up uh, space uh, will be done um, as soon as we have a, a firmer uh, plan or number of options where we can get firm pricing. There is significant uh, revenue, p rental revenue potential, obviously, from giving up space and leasing it out to tenants. However, a s any significant reconfiguration and restack of the bar zone space does come with a significant cost to make that happen. So we will have uh, numbers available for all of that uh, as soon as we can. Okay. Questions about uh, that? Okay. Yes, Jeff. Steve, I have a quick question. Can you go back to the building improvement um, table? I think it might have been 23, 22. This one? Yeah. Just trying to understand the reduction. So on um, on elevators, for instance, capital plan was 250. It proposed was 750. Reduction 475. Yeah, that's and, and so and that's it's not a reduction. It's we're actually spending more. And so just from a calculation, and I should have. This is my table. Um, the, we're accelerating spending for the elevators, uh, the 725 to get it going. If you look at the total five-year total, it's uh, 2.4 million. The 475 is is just the difference between the 725 and the 250. It's just the positive. It's not a reduction. We're spending more. Right. The, the 250 plan. was uh, a, an initial deposit, but in looking at the plan, if we want to accelerate it a little bit, there is some additional uh, prep and engineering work uh, that can happen. So that will add up to about the amount of money that is funded this year. So to the extent we are going to um, use the capital improvement money that we have, um, this particular project, which definitely needs to get done, we can initiate it um, and use the amount of funding that we already uh, have. So it, it seems to make sense to pursue that option. And that okay. is a recommendation. Thanks. 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 Sonia? Um, <coughs> except for floor three and the uh, bar offices, are the rentable space spaces all occupied or how much yeah. of that? Is yes, all of the, the bar occupies about 60% of the building and about 40% of the building is, uh, is uh, tenant space. All the other spaces are leased. There is one tenant whose lease expires uh, this summer. Um, and they, they are definitely, they are relocating to Sacramento. So that one tenant that occupies about 4,000 square feet will be, uh, will be vacating. Other questions? All right, I'm going to um, deviate slightly from our normal uh, process here. I'm going to excuse John and Steve temporarily. Are you through with your presentations? Well, or do you want to go further? Yeah, well, and actually, I'll be very brief. I mean, just the next steps, which is once the board adopts it, right. we would get to legislation. Yeah, we're going to have a little bit, uh, yeah. we're going to deviate. deviate, like I say, and insert. There is a gentleman in the uh, audience, a uh, member of the public, who would like to speak on the budget. Uh, he was actually in the building uh, at the time of our uh, public comment, uh, but wasn't actually here in the room, so didn't have a chance to uh, uh, ask for uh, time to speak. So, uh, Mr. Previn, if you would like to uh, come up and uh, introduce yourself and um, uh, give us your thoughts, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Are we limiting the comments to the budget or just the general? It has to be an budget? item on the agenda. So I, my understanding was you wanted to speak to the budget. Right. But will, will there be uh, additionally an opportunity to give a general public comment if we wait, or is this the only opportunity available? Uh, only, if you, only if you have a comment toward an item on the budget. I mean, excuse me, on the agenda. 
So this is not just kind of open anything you want to talk about. This yeah. is members of the public have an opportunity to talk about an agenda item. So if we have an agenda item, you can talk about it. If it's on the budget, you can talk about it now. If it's something different, we can wait until uh, the end of the open session. Okay, so there, there will be a general comment at the end of the open session. Got yes, so be for, on the the, for the two other gentlemen, at least, who came in and, and uh, no, I'm speaking apparently. For myself, right, yeah. for myself, though, I'll be able to provide a comment at the end. All right. Do you have something on the budget I itself? do. I've just been listening to this great budget report. I'd like to comment on it, but I'm just trying to square right, away. Go ahead and, and talk on the uh, budget then. J address whatever comments you have on the budget okay. in sure. three minutes. Sure. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Um, very interesting for a member of the public. By way of introduction, my name is Eric Previn. I'm a resident of Studio City, a, a journalist, um, and an advocate for better and open government, I should say. And it's worth mentioning that I've uh, spent a teeny bit of time in court myself. Uh, along with the ACLU, we went to the California Supreme Court about attorney billing uh, invoices and what's permissible to see, and we won. And then more recently with the city of Los Angeles, that was against the county, we, uh, myself actually, initially pro per, and then with another attorney, uh, brought a Brown Act matter about special meeting rules, which the appellate court found in our favor, <coughs> and really amended uh, or made clear Brown Act law for, uh, which rarely happens. So it was a big victory for the people. And I was extremely upset, thank you, um, in the aftermath of that when I detected that um, the, the city, who had been excoriated by the appellate court, uh, continued to violate the Brown Act in the same manner, which was basically calling a special meeting, which is on short notice, 24 hours notice, uh, and then denying comments on items noticed on the agenda, which the Brown Act makes clear you have to take comments on items noticed on the agenda. You don't have to give a general public comment, but if it's a, if it's a special meeting, that's a rule. So. When I saw that they were doing that, um, in the aftermath, I contacted an attorney who I'd been working with who helped me get to the appellate court after being pro per. Um, and then I discovered some issues that I'd like to bring up in the context of the budget, which is that I note that um, there's very little uh, in the way of professional competence money available. And I noticed that in terms of, and I realize the bar is mostly about attorneys as opposed to the general public, but I know it's a balance. but. I was uh, appalled to learn that the attorney that I had engaged had made a deal with the city attorney, uh, of which I was not really um, a part. He signed, you know, under the, I guess we had a retainer agreement that says you can do some things, but it was my understanding that in case law, you may not formalize a settlement agreement without the signature of the, the Dumkov, that would be me. And I... I was mortified because the agreement which I discovered months after um, this little agreement had been ratified by him, uh, I discovered it through the Public Record Act, uh, included the vacation of some of my rights to bring further claims about claims I'd brought. So, you know, you may say, sir, you have a problem with an attorney. We have a complaint system that's nicely funded, go over there. But the problem is, is that City Hall itself, and I know that it's sort of in your jurisdiction because it's a lot of lawyers doing work, are taking a position. The, the attorneys um, who bring cases before the courts against the city are faced with a situation where in order to get paid, they are incentivized, and I'm going to use some common language here, to screw their clients. Now, you know, good attorneys will never be a part of that. I think we all agree. But when the city um, says that they will not, um, you know, do the right thing unless you agree to X, Y, and Z, which included, you know, giving up rights without even telling me. I mean, I never saw this settlement agreement. So what I'm reaching for here is, is there some way that the bar can, you know, either provide some kind of... Um, monitoring oversight or or maybe maybe even record you know one thing that we struggle with is that members of the public who are not attorneys uh, often fumble in court it's just hard to do it yourself and the services for people are very hard to access but if 
there were a way to make recordings like we do of general public meetings, and I think the bar could take a, you know, a strong position there. In the recent case where, uh, believe it or not, after this issue where my attorney had um, abandoned me, essentially, um, I sought as an elector and a member of the public to get on the ballot recently, and I've made the ballot several times, and I, you know, got over 635 signatures, which I believed to be valid, and then they were a huge number, and there was an LA Times article about this, were found to be invalid, not just of mine, but Excuse across me, the... Excuse me, sir, uh, yeah. you're into four and into five minutes. Um, if you could please go ahead and wrap up. Yeah, I'll wrap it up. Um, I think that there should be one standard, that attorneys are provided a kind of um, leniency in court, and that pro per, or I thought, were supposed to be accommodated and guided, but my experience was the opposite, and in a very specific way, I talk about those recordings, you know, making uh, recordings available for one price to law firms and a higher, significantly higher price for members of the public, it just feels like the bar is running a kind of, um, you know, I don't know if they don't know what's going on in court in these cases where people are coming with their genuine rights and issues and are being kind of, um, how do I say it? Um, you know, disenfranchised. Okay. I thank, mean, this is thank exactly you very much for your and comments. Thank you. What Mr. is your Brevin? name, by the way? Steinbrecher. Thank Alan you. Steinbrecher. You, right here. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Let's resume the budget conversation then. So I'm just going to jump straight to uh, the staff recommendation to. Um, first approve uh, the budget as, as presented today, um, also authorize staff um, to make adjustments and corrections um, um, prior to its submittal to the legislature on February 28th. And I think there's a resolution. Does anyone have any? Yeah, and I'm open for any questions. All right, are there any questions or comments? The chair will entertain a motion. So when you move, second. Renee seconds. Is there any further discussion? May I substitute the roll? Oh, one left, excuse me, yes, that's right. Uh, please call the roll. Thank you. Uh, before we leave this item, I just want to say that this is obviously a, a very challenging situation. And um, I have asked uh, Donna to um, direct the finance group to uh, explore every possible uh, solution to this problem or possible solution and to report back to us working uh, with the finance committee. So um, it's going to take a lot of work. I look forward to the uh, Crispin and Wakefield report and see where we go from there. But um, obviously, we didn't get the money that we needed for the work that needs to be done, and we need to, um, we need to go from there. Thank you. All right. Uh, we still have uh, a few items on the open agenda, but I want to take a brief five-minute break just so everyone can get up and walk around, and then we'll come back and finish the open uh, session. So let's say at uh, 155.
The next item on the agenda is 703, rule changes addressing public license information and required reporting. Uh, this is a return from public comment and request for approval. And Mr. Holloway, uh, as I understand it from, is it OGC or? Uh, yes, I'm Ken Holloway with the Office of General Counsel. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. So yes, this item is a return from public comment uh, and a request for approval on an amended State Bar Rule 2.2, uh, which would be intended to replace the current State Bar Rules 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4. Uh, by way of background, uh, this rule came about through staff's efforts uh, to work on Objective G of Goal 2 of the State Bar Strategic Plan, uh, which seeks to have all attorneys report firm size and practice type to the State Bar. Uh, in looking at how to make rule revisions uh, to make that happen, uh, staff recognized two relatively big issues. Uh, that brought some other um, some other factors in. The first being the reporting and updating requirements for attorneys that currently exist uh, are spread across an inordinate number of sources. Uh, the current State Bar Rule 2.2, uh, as well as multiple sections of the Business and Professions Code, um, the California Rules of Court, uh, and additionally, uh, information that can be provided on website profiles, but is not in any of those rules. Uh, and the expanded profile on an attorney's uh, My State Bar Profile page. Uh, and as a refresher, the, the expanded profile was uh, added in, I believe, 2008 or 2009 um, and was an opportunity for attorneys to provide information on practice area, uh, to provide photos, websites, and languages spoken in their offices. Uh, and as you heard a little bit in the public comment earlier today, uh, the practice area information uh, was determined, uh, excuse me, uh, the, st the State Bar determined that practice area information should not be made searchable in that process uh, because of comments such as we heard um, earlier in the public comment. Uh, and what has happened with that information, um, the expanded profile can still be provided uh, today, but as of 2018, one more complication is that the, after the separation of the sections, the expanded profile information, so uh, photographs, websites, practice areas, and languages spoken are no longer displayed on the State Bar website. So there was a, a large number of, of issues going on there. Uh, and this, the second big thing flagged by staff was that having the sources all over the place um, many of which and perhaps all of which were written prior to the application of the California Public Records Act to the bar, created a, an opportunity for attorneys to be misled as to what information they were providing would be public, would be displayed, not displayed, uh, and would be subject to public records requests. Uh, so as a result of this, uh, at the September 2019 uh, PROCOM meeting, uh, PROCOM authorized a 60-day public comment period for the amended Rule 2.2. Uh, and I, what I want to point out uh, as sort of a high-level concern that's come up with discussions around this, I think both here and in the public comments, uh, is that the rule as drafted deals only with the reporting requirements and the verification requirements. Uh, so the new rule lays out what information attorneys must provide the State Bar, uh, when they must verify that information, uh, what information they may provide to the State Bar, and what information the State Bar uh, has of an, in its own records that becomes part of their public profile. What it does not directly speak to is what information is displayed on the website. And uh, that's, that's been referenced in the, in the prior uh, PROCOM agenda items and, and discussed, I think, at length, that um, issues regarding what is displayed are largely matters of discretion for the State Bar uh, because, particularly with the application of the CPRA, almost every piece of this information is presumptively public. Um, and so, the, so uh, the rule as it lays out actually makes relatively few changes to what information is uh, reported. And um, if you'll look at this small text on here, we'll see 
it recommends only that the law firm website, which was uh, previously part of the optional expanded profile, become a mandatory reporting item. Uh, that practice sector and law firm size, uh, which come from the strategic plan, uh, be added as mandatory reporting requirements. Uh, and then after public comment, uh, staff has recommended that photos no longer be reported, even optionally. Uh, and the last uh, arguable change is that undergraduate institution uh, currently is collected on attorneys' oath cards they sign upon admission to the bar, uh, but at, at no other point and is not displayed. So by not including that in the proposed rule, uh, we're essentially recommending that it no longer be reported and be taken out of consideration. So in response, uh, in response to the public comment posting, uh, we received 116 public comments uh, regarding the rule. Uh, then, and I will say the top concern with those comments, uh, the vast, vast majority dealt with what information will be displayed on the State Bar website uh, and, and not necessarily with the core of the rule uh, in terms of what information is reported. Uh, this is certainly understandable for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the some of the information we would not recommend collecting if it were not going to be uh, publicly displayed, so things like a website, languages spoken in the office, or practice area are recommended for, as reporting items solely to be displayed. Uh, however, for a lot of other items, uh, that's not the case. Uh, I think the issue um, in public comments was accentuated by a number of those comments coming in response to uh, an email with the title, what, what should display on the State Bar website's attorney profile page? Uh, and I, I think that led to a, a little bit of confusion and a large number of comments um, on some areas that were never intended for display. Uh, so just to run through uh, a couple of the, of the uh, areas that received the most public comments, uh, the first was the reporting of firm size and practice sector. Uh, again, being objected to for display. Uh, the idea that if firm size was posted on everyone's attorney profile page, solo practitioners, small firm practitioners would face bias. Uh, and again, that's, that's not a concern that we have with this uh, recommended amended rule because the information on firm size and practice sector uh, was always intended uh, with the uh, with the State Bar Strategic Plan, always intended to be um, collected for the purpose of the State Bar internally evaluating when an attorney has changed practice areas, changed from, in particular, from a large firm to a solo uh, practice or small practice, so that so that um, so that information can be provided to that attorney uh, and avoid potential attorney misconduct based purely on the fact that an attorney has new responsibilities to client trust funds, things like that. Uh, a second major category of public comment we received was on uh, client trust information, IOLTA account information, again, objecting to that information being displayed publicly. Uh, and yet again, uh, that information was never intended for display. Uh, it is already collected. Uh, and needs to be updated pursuant to uh, BMP code section. Uh, so by bringing IELTS uh, information into this rule, it's re essentially making no change to how any of that information will be treated. Uh, it is just putting all of the required information into one rule instead of having it in five or six different places. Um, the next category of public comments came regarding photographs and websites. Uh, and this is one area where Obviously, the comments were about displaying photos or displaying websites, uh, but this was particularly relevant to the rule itself because, again, photos would only be collected for the purpose of display. Uh, so we received a number of comments that attorney photos, even if completely optional, uh, could cause uh, the invitation of bias on gender grounds, race grounds, on grounds of other uh, visually uh, evident characteristics. Uh, and this was sufficient, I, I think, in staff's evaluation uh, to recommend that photos no longer be uh, even an optional reporting item. Uh, 
Um, and I, I think the motivation behind putting photos uh, out there was identity verification. I know there was some specific comments made about uh, impersonation of attorneys and the thought that these photos uh, could potentially avoid that. Uh, but on balance, uh, even again when optional, I think staff was convinced by a few public comments that uh, it would not serve the public protection um, and access and inclusion efforts of the bar. Um, and then as you heard uh, in the public comment section at the, uh, the beginning of this meeting, um, we heard from the California Lawyers Associ Association and five local bars, uh, including the two organizations that we heard from earlier, regarding the collection of practice area information. Again, practice area information has been collected uh, and can still be collected as part of the expanded profile on an attorney's page. Um, however, that information was uh, initially uh, determined that it, that it would be non-searchable, so it could only be accessed when you pull up uh, a particular attorney. Uh, and then in 2018, that information was taken down from the pages as, as well. Uh, so th that was all subject to similar uh, discussions uh, as to the comments earlier today and the comments received. And these were, again, expected comments uh, from organizations that uh, run lawyer, lawyer referral services. Uh, some of the comments specifically uh, questioned whether allowing searchable public, uh, publicly searchable practice area information would undercut the funding that LRSs receive, uh, and then a number of comments about the, uh, the superior ability of an LRS to actually get a member of the public to an attorney who will do a good job for them. Um, but on balance, uh, at, after receiving these comments, I think staff still believes that the uh, benefit to the public of being able to publicly uh, search by practice area for attorneys, uh, provided that it has the appropriate caveats, that information is provided by the attorney and that the state bar cannot endorse the performance of any attorney in these areas, uh, we still feel is a, a benefit to the public and to public protection. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll flag from the public comments is uh, a, f a small number, five comments, that dealt with the requirement that most information be updated within 30 days of a change. Uh, Staff doesn't feel that this uh, provides any kind of particular burden because the existing rules, State Bar Rule 2.3 and Business and Professions Code 6002.1, uh, both already require updates within 30 days for name, address, phone, email, and discipline in other jurisdictions. Uh, so adding additional elements here uh, is unlikely to, to create any additional burden because when one of those data elements change, it's usually from uh, an attorney getting a new job uh, or moving otherwise, and at that point, many if not all of the reporting uh, elements are going to change. Um, and then the last piece of that, there were several comments regarding firm size and the 30-day reporting, uh, and I think that can be addressed in implementation. Uh, as, as intended, the firm size will be reported in, in very large uh, broad categories rather than attorneys having to report when one attorney joins or leaves their firm. Um, noted in the agenda item are some additional considerations regarding what will be displayed. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's important for us to at least acknowledge, while it's not a core part of the rule, um, that we could afford to be relatively uh, a bit clearer about what information will and won't be displayed uh, and what the intent for implementation is. Uh, and that in the third and fourth columns here on uh, the chart, uh, we can see the reporting information that's currently not being displayed that would be added by the rule, or excuse me, by our intended implementation of the rule, uh, would be returning the law firm website, uh, practice area, and languages spoken onto the profile pages. Uh, and those are all elements that were previously on pages uh, with the expanded profile. Uh, but will be returned uh, now in the intended implementation. Uh, so after uh, reviewing all the public comments, the, uh, the staff has two recommended uh, minor 
edits to the amended rule that went out. The first, as I discussed, was to eliminate the photo requirement uh, in light of the negative public comments and lack of uh, any supportive public comments on including photos. Uh, and the second being just to change the wording for the collection of telephone numbers to make uh, that language the same as the collection of office addresses. Ken, if I would just note, there was Please. actually a typo on that one that you just mentioned. Um, uh, you did, in fact, make it precisely the language, uh, mirroring the language of the address. It should say office telephone number, or if no office is maintained, a telephone number to be used for state bar Correct. It should, correct. Uh, so then that is in subsection B4 of the uh, of the proposed rule. Uh, and so with that, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments? From the members, yes, Chris. Chris. You had a lot of public comment. It looked like from the report, like over sixty-four pages of, you know, comments, um, concerns, whatever. And they, do you feel like what, what you're proposing now kind of addresses those, or you know, some of the? Um, yeah, I, I think what what drove what drove the vast majority of the comments was the concern that elements that have never been proposed to be displayed online would get displayed online. In particular, bank account information for client trust funds. Uh, the IOLTA account information already needs to be uh, provided and updated under the BNP code, but by moving it uh, into this proposed rule, flagging it, noting in the rule itself that everything is presumptively public under the CPRA, uh, I think that resulted in commenters uh, being very concerned that, oh, does this mean my bank account number is going to be up on the website. Uh, things like that made up the, the, the bulk of the, the lengthy comments in particular, those kind of concerns. Um, so for that reason, I, I do feel like the, the small edits that we made um, are sufficient to address the only real issues that we, we felt. I think the photo issue was the one from public comment that we felt uh, really had some merit as to whether we should be collecting in the first place or not. Josh. Um, two questions. One might uh, first be a clarification. Sure. Uh, the difference between practice area and practice sector, I think you had in there? Yeah, that did come up a few times, too. And that, that's, uh, that's something that, that will be very clear in the implementation, but I think is un unfortunately uh, perhaps unclear in, in what we presented. So practice sector, which was the, the, intent, uh, the intended information that we wanted to, to collect under the state bar strategic plan, is very broad, uh, very broad type of practice, um, law firm practice, in-house counsel, public interest, uh, just at that highest level. Uh, and again, that was intended to be collected to flag attorneys that are making big transitions so that materials can be provided for them, contact information can be provided for them uh, to ease that transition. The optional practice area reporting would be uh, things like family law, much uh, more specific information that would be provided by the attorneys themselves and be optional. Um, and then on the implementation and, and the practicality of this, I, I, I want to dig into that just for a moment. I, is, that, um, is that a drop-down menu where you choose one or more, or are you able to fill that in? For practice area specifically? That's correct. Uh, it could be done either way. I. I think my impression from discussions has has been that attorneys would be allowed to provide uh, their own you know, type in their own description, uh, and I and again this is you know it's outside it's outside the rules and the implementation and I, I could see reasons why we might not want to allow that. Uh, Don, I don't know if you yeah, have any so more. Yeah, so if I may, I'm Dina De Loretto, the director of uh, the Office of Attorney uh, Attorney Regulator. ARCR um, is on the phone um, and may be better positioned to answer that question. So, Dina, if you could respond to Josh's question. Hi there. Can you hear me all right? We can. Thank you, Dina. Great. Uh, the, actually, currently it is a drop-down indeed, and it can be um, – you can choose more than one option. 
but as uh, was mentioned, they're not currently being displayed publicly, so we kind of suspended being, displaying those publicly until we make these decisions. But the, the current way it's uh, devised is that it's a drop-down with um, select, multiple selections can be made. So there wouldn't be ne uh, necessarily, uh, if I chose to, I was a general practitioner and I wanted to add every one of the drop-down segments as my practice area, I would have the ability to do that. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Brandon. In regards to the uh, practice area information and it being searchable, I understand that there, um, in addition to the comments that were made today, also other public comments about people glossing over uh, different um, advisory statements such as this information has not been vetted by the um, state bar things of that nature, wouldn't it be, um, or I, I guess, would it be practical to, um, when an individual goes and presses that search button, um, that it, another dialog box opens up and say, and then that's when the disclaimer is and that person agrees to it, um, wouldn't that get that information out there, um, I, I guess, effectively and then also maybe address some of the concerns that the uh, LRS uh, providers are, are talking about? Yeah, so um, I, I really love the creative thinking. I had similar conversations with Sean the other day. Um, we, we do think that there are ways like that. I, I can't speak precisely to the technology of it, but uh, exactly like that where it may not be embedded in the midst of the profile, but somewhere else that makes it makes you look at it, makes it more obvious. Um, yeah, we are certainly open to uh, all of the appropriate caveats. Um, including, um, you know, this is this is a, the you know the state bar is not endorsing the uh, abilities of the attorney in the practice area. This is a self-professed uh, a practice area. Um, uh, you know, we would have put a link there to the lawyer referral services page on our website. Um, so I think there are a variety of opportunities that we would have technologically to make those kinds of disclaimers um, more evident. And um, because I think that, you know the commenter. Uh, uh, Ms. Chalmers had a point, you know, we all skim over disclaimers, and so if we put them in a place that makes it more likely that you'll read it, um, that, that would be, um, it, that would be a, a better way to uh, make sure that the information is getting, uh, getting across and that we are continuing to provide uh, information about how to access the lawyer referral services in everybody's individual communities. So, um, yeah, that's very helpful. I mean, um, on, on the issue of the searchable, self-reported practice area issue, um, I'm a little torn about this because I think the legal referral services have made some valid points. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, uh, and I'm not criticizing them, but that also reflects a certain amount of paternalism. And so if we have information of, that's of use to the public, um, then I think we should make it available and we should make it searchable because if you have the information on a site that it's not searchable, then it's really not of much practical um, assistance. So, um, so it seems to me we should proceed with the self-reported practice areas, but just as one example, if it says right on the website, this is self-reported practice areas from the attorney, that alone is, is an indication. Um, but I think it would be great to have a report from staff, uh, say at the next meeting when they're looking at how to implement this with some more details about how it'll look on the website and the board might provide some feedback. I think highlighting the services the legal referral services offer is really important, uh, especially to certain groups of clients. Other clients, um, you know, they may prefer to do their own research and feel like they want to have the ability to do that. And that's where I feel like we have to offer them both options, but let's make sure they're informed about legal referral services, but also other issues in selecting a lawyer. I know the bar for a long time has had brochures uh, for the public about some guidelines about selecting an attorney, sort of consumer beware type of things, and maybe we could put some put some thought into um, putting that on the website as well. So I think we can balance these concerns and both provide the information to the public and address the valid concerns that have been raised. Josh. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I mean, I would be inclined to support it if we could have a staff report back on implementation. I, I don't disagree um, 
that it's a delicate balance and an important one. Um, and I don't, um, and it's not necessarily because of the LRS is, I just think we have an obligation to make sure that the information we have is um, uh, truthful and verified uh, or uh, uh, very clearly disclaimed. Yeah, so by staff report back on implementation, uh, I just want to, for clarity purposes, um, understand. So we would be talking about basically giving you screenshots of what this would look like before we would deploy anything. Uh, uh, personally, I think that would be very helpful. We could easily do that. Are there any other comments or questions at this time from members? All right, we have somebody uh, in the audience, uh, Jeremy Evans. Uh, I understand on behalf of the uh, California Lawyers Association who would like to make a comment or two on this. Uh, please come up, introduce yourself, and um, please limit yourself to three minutes. As you can imagine, we're a little tight on time here. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see all of you, uh, for those of the folks that I've met. Um, other than just submitting to the... Yes. Other than uh, just submitting to the... A letter that we've already, you know, put forward to the uh, to the board here. Um, just a couple comments. One is is that, um, as you all know, when the CLA and the state bar split, one of the big things was that the state bar was going to focus on licensing and discipline, and the CLA was going to focus on education and and uh, helping with attorneys and marketing and that sort of thing. So, in some sense, I think we find it a little ironic that. Um, that uh, the policy in some sense offers free marketing to attorneys because it's sort of putting these practice areas up on the website and they're not being verified. If anything, maybe a better approach would be if the state bar were to offer more um, specialties uh, tests so that those folks could actually put on their website or on the you know, state bar website that says, um, you know, I've taken the family law test to be a specialist or whatever it might be. And currently I think those practice areas are very limited uh, and then lastly, um, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see the rest of the time, is sort of really taking a look at the role, and it's been talked about a little bit here, of uh, the, lawyer referrals, the lawyer referral service programs and what they do. Um, you know, ultimately, um, there's no verification from the state bar, and I think that worries me a little bit about consumers. And when they go on the website and they see that, and if somebody's an opportunistic attorney and they just check all... 50 boxes, um, and there's no verification of what they practice. So I'll, I'll submit on that, and thank you all for your time. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Evans? Thank you. All right, Mr. Holloway. Are there any further questions then for Mr. Holloway? The chair will entertain a motion uh, uh, for the resolution to uh, pass the resolution. Mr. Uh, chair? Josh? I'm sorry. <coughs> this is uh, Tila Chalmers again from Alameda County. I'm wondering if the uh, chair would entertain further comments from the phone. Certainly. Public comment closed. Uh, thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm from Alameda County. So uh, I really appreciate uh, Sean's remark about, uh, about the balance and about the concern of paternalism. I, I do want to express that I think that's sort of the essence of public protection. Um, if we were to worry too much about the paternalism idea, we would just let lawyers and their clients duke it out, but the state bar does very appropriately step in when, when things go bad. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's an important piece. If the state bar wants to launch its own lawyer referral service, this is against my own interest, but I think that would be awesome. Uh, there are great uh, online tools now. The state bar has a lot of reach. Uh, that, that would be terrific, and whether local bars continued or not, that's fine. But um, I, I think that I'm not sure what benefit this tool offers beyond Google, where you can go on and type Oakland family attorney or San Diego landlord tenant attorney. Uh, this doesn't seem to me to add anything else, and it poses a very significant risk that you'll just end up with many more 
uh, disgruntled and uh, cheated uh, clients who, who, who don't really have much recourse. So uh, that's my concern. I'm happy to talk about it more. Uh, we would love it if the Board of Governors might continue the matter and have another, sorry, Board of Trustees, have a, a deeper conversation. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? All right. We have a, a motion from uh, Josh Pertula. Do I have a second? Second from Chris. What are we... Yeah, can I? Sure. You, you want to offer a friendly amendment? No, not at all. But, but um, yeah, just for clarification, Mark, I, I was kind of thinking, I think I know where you're going. So it seems to me, and I just would like to clarify, that um, the resolution is simply adopting these proposed rules that relate to information that lawyers must report to the state bar, there's really nothing in here that controls what the state bar uh, posts on the website, if I understand that correctly. So, and it sounds like really the sense of the board is that the details of searchable practice areas and so on is, is will come back to the board for some more discussion. Right, the agenda item lays out um, at the end uh, the, a chart similar to what Ken had displayed um, in terms of what the what we would be displaying out of it, but the the resolution goes um, just to the adoption of the language of the rule. Um, and I didn't know, Josh, if we were uh, do, we were doing the resolution as amended um, with the amended uh, amendment that you provided, which was that staff would um, return to the board with uh, the. Um, uh, sort of the the screenshots for how how it would be how it would be implemented. That was my understanding. That's my reading. That's yes. my yes. reading. Yes. yes, and I think I think generally. Um, yes, that you're correct. Yeah, the exact details of how the op website appears uh, is generally not something the board specifically approves. There is one exception to that we've made regarding um, what do we call them, consumer alerts about discipline and so on. And so it's certainly a valid area for the board to inquire in when there's a policy issue. And I think this is this is an area where that seems to be manifest. But um, so I don't think we need a resolution at this time because we've asked staff to come back to us with some more information about the website aspect of this, but uh, I don't think you need to worry about approving something regarding the public facing website because that's not what the resolution uh, on the table addresses. So. But, it, but I'm glad for the clarification because I had the very same uh, question in my mind. I'm fine without the resolution just knowing that So, and if, if we can we can either just have that agreement or add, I think it's totally fine to add staff to return to the board regarding uh, implementation. All right, let's do that. So you accept that amendment, and Chris, okay, okay. So it's the motion is as uh, amended. Is there any further discussion? May I substitute the rule? No? Mr. In and Out. Okay. <laughs> Drop in. Yes. Ken. Cisneros. Aye. Bill Aye. Dellen. Yes. Duran. Aye. Iglesias. Yes. Lebron. Yes. Manning. Yes. Pertula. Yes. Sellis. Yes. Item 704, exemption to CalPERS 180-day wait period. Vanessa. Diane Blackman, uh, before her retirement, was an employee, long-term employee with the State Bar in the um, role of providing staff support for the Judicial Nominees Evaluation Commission, among other matters. The government code um, requires that an individual cannot come back to work as a retired annuitant uh, within six months following her retirement date, unless the governing board of the contracting entity certifies to a critical need for the individual's skills within the six-month waiting period. Um, staff would like that um, waiver 
from would like that um, uh, certification from this board because uh, Ms. Blackman has unique institutional knowledge and specialized skills and to ensure operational continuity in the support of the Jenny Commission work. So um, the resolution is before you that the Board of Trustees adopt the resolution set forth in Attachment A. Attachment A has all the critical legal requirement elements for um, to support the resolution and it essentially certifies that there is a critical need to appoint Ms. Blackman as a retired annuitant prior to the 180-day CalPERS waiting period. And Attachment A is um, attached to the, res to the resolution and the item. I don't know if you want to put it up on the uh, screen. Okay. We've done these before. Are there any questions or comments? May I have a motion? Brandon and, I'm sorry, second was Mark? Oh, no, uh, Jose. So Brandon moved and Jose seconded. Is there any further discussion? Now may I substitute the rule? All right. Motion passes. 705 uh, has been withdrawn. 706, waiver for good cause of poli policy restricting Leo Wilson from conducting business with the state bar after leaving office pursuant to board policy, manual 11.2. Uh, Vanessa? Yes, uh, state board policy does restrict senior management, such as an executive director, from doing business with the state bar within a year following the termination of their employment. But again, the board may waive this uh, policy for good cause, and uh, staff recommends that uh, the board approve the waiver of the restriction for good cause to be able to um, contract with uh, Ms. Wilson because she is uh, important, essential as a consultant to support successful implementation of different policy initiatives that are listed on page two of the item. The Adels work, OCTC culture improvement, limited lease license legal tech working group, state bar annual report, follow up to the racial disparity studies in the discipline system, the CAPA study, the justice gap phase two, and the Office of Access and Inclusion uh, projects. The resolution is on the uh, screen that the board waived the board policy manual section 11.2 uh, as applied to Leah for good cause as discussed on this date. Is there any discussion? Brandon moves and Sonia seconds. Any further discussion? May I substitute the roll? Motion passes. All right, that's the end of the uh, open agenda. However, we have a couple of uh, people uh, from the public who I understand would like to address the board. Uh, we will now take those public comments. Uh, so whoever would like to lead off, please come forward. Please state your name, make sure your microphone is on, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Thank you. All right, there we go. So, yes, uh, Wayne from Encino, that's what I go by. I was here last March, and you had a number of very large gentlemen take and throw me out of this building forcefully all the way into the street. Now, that was in... March 2019, and then in April, what I was going to talk about, the FBI raided Mike Fear's office. He, he didn't listen. You're not listening. What's going on <laughs> with you guys, the city attorney's office? We got bar number 175953, Paul Martin Corcorian, not eligible to practice for failure to pay bar license fees and dues. He's the chairman of the Los Angeles City Council Budget and Finance Committee that hired the Paradis Law Firm that defrauded Price Waterhouse Coopers. You know, listen, so I try to come here, you know. Uh, November 2019, I went to the DWP Commission 
And I was physically threatened. I couldn't even go to their meeting. You know, listen. So we're sitting here because of lawyer misconduct in the city attorney's office, and all you had to do was do your jobs. That's all you had to do. She don't want to do your job. So everybody comes after me. i got to fight for my life. There's people right now who work for the union of DWP employees that want to kill me because I have something else about the Price Waterhouse Coopers case, and I have to do this myself because I have nobody with the government that will help me and protect my life. They are right now defrauding tens of millions of dollars a month in more fraudulent charges that the raid went on. So see, essentially, PricewaterhouseCoopers is the second largest accounting firm. They're right down the street here. I think you know who they are. The second largest in the world. And they were falsely accused, litigated, and put through living hell, their reputation, their clients on the line for something that the city tried to make them do, which was to make a billing system to cover up fraud, and they wouldn't do it. And they had to take and, and, and hire private investigators, and they had to go to the FBI to do it, and finally they took the fifth. So we have two law firms that Mr. Krikorian hired for the city, One's in Ohio and one's in New York with $67 million cash of city money. Where's the money? It's gone. All you had to do was do your job. I filed bar complaints against Mr. Krikorian. You responded back. He's a city councilman. We have no jurisdiction. We can't look into the matters. Mr. Hugo Stefan Rossiter files Four restraining orders against me. He lost the last two in May 2019. While I was suing him, he represented the city because he blew a deadline on extending my first phony TRO. You don't listen. So where do we go? What can we do? And it's going to come down to what you want your children and your grandchildren to live in. What kind of society? You want them to be hunted down like animals because they're whistleblowers? Or do you just want pay to play? Everybody can pay to play. All you do is you just get the money and you give it to Jose Weizar. He has a bar license, too, which um, you've allowed him to be voluntarily inactive. Rated by the FBI, his house, his staff, he's being sued by three staffers for retaliation. His, his license is active, too. Why? Why? Ask yourselves that. And this Leah Wilson, didn't uh, wasn't there an article about her avoiding MCLEs? And you just waived a six-month conflict rule, a very good conflict rule, to let her immediately come back and do business and get paid by you people when you, when you terminated her services. You, you're repeating the same mistakes. So I know you like the people you associate with. I know you look at me like, like I'm a dog. I know. But we're all human beings. We all pay utility bills. And someday you will know somebody you love and care about that will find out about something and stick their nose where it doesn't belong. And they're going to wind up where many people are. Thank God for Price Waterhouse Coopers and their lawyers. The guts, they risk their lives. To, to fight that case. They could have paid $37 million of the city, and they would have dropped the whole thing. All right, thank but you, But they sir. went ahead, over and, time, and, and, and they And we fought. appreciate your comments. Thank you. And finally, why do I have to wait till 15 till 3 to speak for three minutes? You know why? Because you don't want me to speak. That's thank why. Thank you. We've heard you. Thank you. Mike Test. Thank you. Again, three minutes, please. So, again, listen to the reports of the public. Do you not feel embarrassed for the fact that you have people using their bar license in City Hall to protect themselves under the color of law, violate my civil rights, violate your children's future civil rights, by what? Corruption. 
Listen to these bar license number. 115953 for the record. And what about the other non-algebra inactive bar license? 195726. However, you do have an active bar license number under 247653, Fable Strafon Edward, in which the Stanley Moss courts told me not to say his name ever, ever, ever. And you bring this upon my mind as a human being solely because I have a disability. And you don't want to be biased. However, it sounds biased when you take a side. When you punish people under SLAP. S-L-A-P-P. -P, participation. And then you put three TROs against me. Under 19 STRO 03037. In which you send me a letter that you say it's not of your interest that this attorney under Rossiter, Stephen, Hugo, can take this action against me or any person for speaking their mind out. De-escalation. But no, you, you'd rather have me be offensive to protect my civil rights under United States versus Bagdazarian? Or what about uh, Whitney versus California? And what about the so-called Homeland Security that told me a government, local entity, called them upon me for speaking out against corruption, abuse, fraud, and waste? And yet you want me to be silent. You want to prohibit me from engaging in my right to protect your children's future. And the future of my child who sits behind me quietly, a service dog, PTSD. And you ask me twice when I enter this building, nowhere in your budget this morning did you discuss anything regarding ADA.gov. How to have reasonable accommodations and fund monies for people with disabilities, whether it's invisible or not. So I brought for you on the record four pages with information that I'm submitting into your record on my behalf and that of the gentleman who spoke before me, Wayne Spindler. Because Jennifer H. Copps came all the way from Stanton to the Stanley Boss Courts from Long Beach to put a restraining order against me because my words are harsh, robust, and you can't tolerate me. And all I'm doing is simply engaging in what I believe in, the 45th president. And I can't speak at public meetings. But what did Jennifer H. Copps from Long Beach say? that this is not offensive, it's free speech. And never did I sit back there waving it at you because I have respect for the bar. So I demand the bar to be respectful to me and provide me accommodations when I come and provide me information when I come, provide me effective communication, not because I'm disabled, but because simply I'm making an inquiry on behalf of public interest to resolve my complaints, my issues regarding the person that I mentioned, Mr. Fobble, okay, Edward, thank you very much. Uh, to stop over time. the stay away orders against me. You need to stop him from putting me under that stress. I'm under a lot of stress you can't even imagine. Okay. And thank if, you, sir. And if thank I could you. do something in regards to that, believe me, God is on my side. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Here you go for the record. Four pages. One, two, three, four. Matter of fact, I can count. Thank you, sir. All right, the open session is now concluded. Uh, in just a few moments, we will go into closed session. Um, in fact,
fact, we'll go into closed session immediately. I did it before, but I'll do it again. Sarah, we're going into the same closed session uh, for the same reasons that I said before. 